Vice Chair Farsan. Uh, present. Anj. Present. Commissioner Maggio. Present. Commissioner Mason. Present. Commissioner Cass. Oh, you're muted. Present. Commissioner Gray. Present. Commissioner Sim. He's, um, Eugene, you're muted. Greg, are you able to unmute him? See what I can do. Um, he's using his cell phone as a microphone. And he just left me a voicemail, but he says he needs someone to allow him in. And do you know the last four of his mobile? Uh, yeah, just one moment. Um, Actually, I don't. No. I have it as 1936, but uh, I'm not seeing that number. Yeah, Eugene, what's the last four digits of your mobile? 6982. Letting him in? Okay, Greg's letting you in now. Commissioner Sim. His mobile has disappeared from the queue. So we can give it another minute, see if he tries to rejoin with the mobile. There we go. Hello? Yep. Hi, we can hear you. Woo Thank you for everyone's patience. Okay, I am here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then I am Commissioner Sturm and I am present. And um, before we go on to adopting the agenda, I meant to do my little spiel at the opening of the meeting. Um, per typical practice, public comments submitted before the meeting to planner at lovelafayette.org have been distributed to all planning and design review commissioners and staff and will be posted as part of the public record. Members of the public may submit live public comment during the Zoom meeting by using the raise hand feature. Um, any graphic that any speaker wishes to share should have been emailed to planner at lovelafayette.org by 3 p.m. today. Um, if, if you just happen to be watching through the YouTube channel and you want to join the meeting, a reminder that the link for joining the meeting is found on the agenda, which is found in the calendar on the city website. Okay, um, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Chair Serum, this is Gary Heising. Yes. Um, you didn't call my name, but I am present. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> you know why my little, sorry about that. Thank you, Commissioner Heising. Okay. You don't I had you crossed problem. out from the last meeting when you had an excuse absence and my brain didn't register it. Okay. Thank I you, Commissioner Heising. I make a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Second. All in, oh, roll call vote again. Uh, Vice Chair Farsan. Aye. Commissioner Heising. Aye. Commissioner Labange. Aye. Commissioner Maggio. Aye. Commissioner Mason. Aye. Commissioner Cass. Aye. Commissioner Gray. Aye. Commissioner Sim. Aye. And Commissioner Sturm. Aye.
All right. Uh, we're on. Let's see, do we have any public comments for items not on the agenda? So this portion of the agenda is inviting public comments within the purview of the Planning Commission or Design Review Commission for items that are not on tonight's agenda. So uh, potentially a future agenda or add items of uh, general, uh, generally within their purview. So please use the raise hand function or star nine on your phone. I'm not seeing any at this time. All right, uh, we're on to item four, consent calendar. Do I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar? Are there any comments on the meeting minutes? They were, I believe they were design review commission meeting minutes. Yeah, they were design review. Uh, I'll make a motion to adopt the consent I'll calendar. Second. Okay, and then uh, do a full roll call vote. Vice Chair Farsan. Aye. Commissioner Heising? Aye. Commissioner LaVange? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner Mason? Aye. Commissioner Cass? Aye. Commissioner Gray? Aye. Commissioner Sim? Aye. And Commissioner Sturm? Aye. Okay, um, motion carries. Moving on to item five, study sessions, none, signs, none. No continued public hearings. So that brings us to item 8A, our new public hearing, uh, MS 50220, land use permit 0320, design review 2519, Miramar, Mount Diablo Boulevard, uh, C1 zoning, request for minor subdivision, design review, land use permit, grading permit, category two tree permit, for the redevelopment of a commercially developed parcel into a mixed use development consisting of five residential buildings. And we are looking at the, we're reviewing the design of the project tonight and providing feedback. And that's our, mm -hmm. that's our main focus. So um, Nancy, we're ready for a staff report. Good evening, Commissioners. Nancy Tram, Planning Department staff. The items before you are MS50220, L0320, and DR2519, which proposes to demolish an existing business and professional office development known as Corporate Terrace with three buildings and 247 surface parking spaces to construct a mixed use development with 198 residential units and 29,000 square feet of commercial office on two merged and reconfigured parcels at 3470 and 3462 Mount Diablo Boulevard near the intersection of Mount Diablo and First Street. The project requires design review since it's located within the downtown, minor subdivision, land use permit, grading permit, and um, tree permit approvals, and also demolition permit because demolishing the existing buildings. The subject property is zone C1 commercial and located at the western edge of the downtown east end um, district. Part of the site is within a half mile of public transit. Here is a brief summary of the project. Um, one three-story 29,000 square foot commercial building is proposed along Mount Diablo Boulevard. The housing portion um, consists of five residential buildings a commons building and a game house, um, ranging from one to four stories, the majority which is sited over podium parking. And you can see the outline here. There will be 198 residential units, uh, 154 of them for sale and 44 of them rental. There will be 20, 223 partially assigned parking spaces in the podium structure and the surface lot along First Street and 98 bicycle spaces dispersed throughout the site. Of the 198 total residential units, 146 are allowed per density and 52 bonus units are allowed under the state density bonus law since the project is providing 30% affordable units on its base density. In addition to exceeding density, um, yeah. waivers from development standards are requested under the state density bonus law from height, 
parking and design objective standards. The project is also requesting two concessions from complying with the inclusionary housing requirement to aggregate all inclusionary units into building one and not meet the unit mix requirement. What was that last one? And not to meet the unit mix requirement. Um, these are the three lots proposed. Um, the rental, the um, residential units, and then the commercial. Um, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of what was proposed in the previous study session in 2019 and what is currently proposed. And second views of the project showing the podium parking underneath most of the site. Um, and renderings of each of the buildings. Since publication of the staff report, staff received four public comments, which were forwarded to the commission earlier today. And based on the review of the project against the downtown specific plan, its objective stand design standards, downtown design guidelines, and downtown um, and the downtown design guidelines, staff recommends the following recommendations. Um, this is just a summary. The specifics are listed in the staff report. Um, staff recommends improving the pedestrian scale and experience on the podium walkway. Incorporating on-site pedestrian connection, linking the downtown to the future multi-purpose pathway on the EB Mud Aqueduct right-of-way and to construct a pathway portion consistent with the Aqueduct Trail concept. Uh, to revisit residential commercial building design with respect to details, colors, materials, and transparency. To locate and screen and serve um, screen service utilities from public view. Plant additional trees to provide further screening along First Street and the freeway. And incorporate bioretention facilities in the island reconfiguration along Mount Diablo Boulevard. Staff recommends um, that the commissions provide design feedback direct the applicant to respond to comments and forward the matter for review by the Planning Commission, Transportation and Circulation Commission, and also invite the Public Art Committee to a joint hearing on December 7th. This concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Okay, does anyone have questions Oops. of staff? Uh, Commissioner Maggio. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Strom. Uh, Nancy, I wonder if you could pull up the drawings and with a pointer walk us through each one of those recommendations, exactly where um, those recommendations fall on, on the overall plan with regard to the walkway and all of those other things so I can be certain exactly what you're recommending. So actually, let me pull, I don't have the list of right in front of me. Let me have them side by side. Just a minute. It's kind of a multiple screen task, isn't it? <laughs> I'm so, sorry, but it would be very helpful to just really pinpoint exactly what we're, we're talking about for discussion. So one of them was the um, the East Made Mud um, interface. Are you seeing my presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the East Bay Mud uh, Trail would be along. This is the East Bay Mud parcel. Um, mm -hmm. Staff recommends having a direct connection through the site. Um, as proposed, the applicant is 
um, had stated that there's some topography issues and are currently proposing that um, any connection to the future trail would be along the street, along the sidewalk and to- What side of that um, egress are you recommending for the trees, the additional tree planting? Um, along the west side. The, the west side? That's right, we can. Okay. And then, um, Uh, the the front the Mount Diablo. Can I jump in real quick on that topography issue? Yeah. Is the grade Nancy? Is it that the grades are different from the site to the East Bay Mud? Yes, um, it slopes up from right Mount away. Diablo. I mean, what what kind of grades are we talking? That there there couldn't be a slope easement or or some grading done to to match to allow the trail to connect there. I don't know the exact um, slope grade change, but it is at least 10 feet from um, Mount Diablo up towards the EB mud right away. It's pretty, it's, I was just out there today and the area adjacent to the parking lot along First Street is a pretty low slope. And then it looks like as you go east, it gets steeper. Although like the ridge sort of moves out a little bit from the property line. Yeah, okay. I'm just wondering if, if there's a, a spot in the middle where it's not, you're not forcing residents to go all the way over to First Street to get onto the trail, if there's a, it's at least some sort of location on the, on the project that would be a, a nice trail entry point. Um, it, maybe the civil engineer could look at that or respond to that when we get to that applicant's mm -hmm. um, presentation. It is, yeah. it is a nice thought to be able to connect the project to the trail. Yeah, and then there was a recommendation on First Street as well for additional landscape and screening. The landscape um, requested is more along right around here just to screen the parking um, and then the building over here. Since a lot of cars will be driving up the First Street, you may see it. Okay, then yeah, there's there's a whole list of recommendations that are more design uh, recommendations, and so I'll I'll wait and see what the design review commissioners um, have to discuss with that. But uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Raju. I'm just scrolling through to see if we have any other hands for questions for staff. Gary. Oh, I see Commissioner Heising. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so Nancy, I was wondering, could you, can you just walk us through how um, the parking reduction, how the, you know, what, what quantified or how did we get from 264 to 223? Just walk us through that math or is that something more appropriate for the developer to talk about? Um, I believe it is a footnote in the staff report. Um, yeah, maybe I missed that footnote. It's for the benefit of us and the public. It should be footnote number eight. Um, building one is the affordable, um, the BMR building, um, because the um, because what they're proposing, um, they are eligible for a reduction in the ratio um, versus what's required under the municipal code. So it's 0.5 parking spaces per bedroom. And then all the other buildings are subject to the uh, Lafayette municipal code um, with the exception of 5% reduction for the half mile um, art proximity and um, that's, I believe that's it. So all of that is part of the concession that's laid out. That is part right. of the waiver request. Sorry, the waiver request, yeah. Okay. okay. Got it. 
And then um, my other question was regarding the East Bay mud right away. I know in other projects we've, um, especially ones that have been um, abutting up to 24, we've asked applicants to um, install landscaping in the Caltrans right away. Is there, um, is there an ability for landscaping to be in the East, to augment the strip of the East Bay mud property adjacent to the development to add more landscaping in that area or was that explored with believe, the applicant? Um, I believe it is possible since um, one of the recommendations was to design and construct um, the pathway. So the landscaping would probably be included as part of that. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Yeah, sorry, I just had one more. Um, there were some traffic uh, concerns from um, the Public Works Department. Um, emails dated April 6th of 2020 and May 29th of 2020. And I saw, I saw the back and forth interaction um, between planning and public works, but I didn't see, um, I didn't see responses to those two, those two emails I mentioned. And I just wanna make sure that some of those concerns from public works staff, that, that those concerns have been addressed. Um, some have and some haven't. They were um, attached to the staff report, but I didn't see any other follow-up emails. Uh, some have and some haven't. Um, I would defer to the applicant to respond, but I expect um, it would be further discussed in the upcoming meeting with the Transportation and Circulation Commission. Okay, thank you. That's all I had, Madam Chair. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Heising. Um, any other questions for staff? No, okay. Yeah, yes, oh. Chair. Uh, Chair Stern, uh, this is yes. uh, Eugene. Thank you yes. very much. Uh, this, uh, to uh, the uh, staff, uh, there were three items from the uh, public. Um, uh, one of them from uh, Ms. McDonald about uh, noticing and uh, clear um, uh, sign boards. And then second was from a Ms. Merchant about the inclusionary housing issue uh, and how that uh, works uh, from how they've uh, singularly placed all the um, items in building uh, one. Of course, that's uh, under discretion, of course, but that's a, a comment from this uh, public. And the third was the tree sizing, uh, how the current applicant has come up with a tree sizing factor. And if, uh, that was from a Ms., uh, Mr. McCain. So this is to Nancy. Nancy, can you just uh, give us a feedback on these items from the public? Sure. Um, so for the sign boards, um, staff did um, note, notice the project per the municipal code, but if the commission chair just um, wants additional notification, um, that can be um, done at a future for a future hearing. Um, for the tree mitigation calculation, the applicant's calculation is incorrect. Um, but uh, the Arborist report from Inside Out for the city's consultant um, corrects that. So um, any tree mitigation measures would be based on those numbers. And what was the other one? The um, aggregating the inclusion in housing. Yeah, that is requested as a concession or concessions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Stern. Thank you. Okay, I was just making a, a note about the noticing. Okay. Um, all right, if there are no further questions for staff, then we are ready for the applicant's presentation, if they are planning on making one. They are. I'm letting them in now.
I see Mr. Hariri. Is Mr. Masano on? Yes, I'm on. Very good. Yeah, I'd like um, um, Perry to yep. start off the presentation. Great. Greg, um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, members of uh, Planning Commission and Design Review Committee and Greg, uh, thank you for uh, reviewing our project tonight. Um, I'm Perry Herreri with uh, Miramar Capital. We're the owners of the property. We've owned it for the last uh, two years. Um, and uh, we believe we're going to present a project to you tonight that the community at large can take great pride in. Um, it embodies the, the vision, the goals, and policies of the um, East Downtown Specific Plan. It's uh, going to be an attractive mixed-use committee community with uh, direct access to uh, the shopping center across the street, the library across the street. Um, it's within walking distance to BART, um, within a half a mile of BART. Um, it's close to the park theater and the small park. And it really does exactly what the specific plan intended it to do was to invigorate and activate this area. Um, when, we, when we do a project, we like to get the community stakeholders involved as much as possible. To that end, we've um, used a local architect that's been there for decades. Their office is across the street from the property, uh, Tim Ward and Mike Masano. Um, we've uh, really uh, engaged in a partnership with Sunflower and Rosemary Kerbach to uh, put together the affordable housing offering. Um, they provide uh, affordable housing for adults with developmental uh, disabilities. And this is a very unique uh, opportunity to do that here by placing all the units together. And Rosemary will be here later tonight to, to speak about that. And then we've also uh, partnered with uh, the Park Theater Trust to try to uh, offer a donation to acquire the theater and um, renovate it um, as a public art benefit. So um, with that, I'll let Mike Masano talk about the project specifics. Well, actually, before I go, um, last year, about a year and a half ago, we had another study session. And I think we've incorporated the major comments from that study session. The big one was uh, the amount of surface parking we had the last time. Uh, uh, consensus desire to put that underground. We've accomplished that. We put all the parking underground, uh, great effort and kind of um, engineering um, effort and cost. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about adding commercial office because of the lack of it in town. And we've accomplished that as well. We've added a 30,000 square foot commercial office on Mount Diablo Boulevard. That'll be one of the first new commercial office building built in a long time. So I'll let Mike talk about the project specifics. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my screen now. We have a fly through that we generated in the office here, sort of showing the project in 3D. Um, consists of five multifamily residential buildings and our commercial building here. Um, each building is four stories and has photovoltaic cells on the roof. Four of the five buildings have rooftop gardens. They're all connected with what we call Lafayette Lane here, which is a, a, a way through the project that connects Mount Abel Boulevard and uh, First Street. Uh, coming down to the commercial building, it has uh, two three-story wings and the center of it is connected with a plaza that is in an intermediate level between Mount Abel Boulevard and Lafayette Lane. Uh, this is the access from Mount Abel Boulevard. You can get into the underground parking or travel up to the side for the drop off and pick up. The commercial building has several accesses directly off of Mount Diablo. It's also connected directly to the parking underground. 
And so we're passing over the uh, plaza up to Lafayette Lane. <clears throat> As you can see, Lafayette Lane is flanked by the residential buildings, which have access from the lane as well as the underground parking via elevator and stairway. This is our commons building. Here, uh, moving back, this is the drop off and pick up area that's accessed from Mount Diablo Boulevard. Uh, notice the bollards, there's no, uh, no vehicle traffic allowed on Lafayette Lane. This is another shot of the commons building, the top area. Uh, moving back towards the game house, this is the aqueduct beyond. This is the grading that we're talking. We have a retaining wall there now. Uh, pulling back a bit, we'll see this is a first street beyond coming between the commons and building number four. To look at building number five, it has its own little courtyard here. Moving towards building number one, this is the building that's dedicated to adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, backing up from Lafayette Lane on the right, you'll see the access to the parking structure from the First Street. Uh, moving up, we have a nice view of a typical rooftop garden. The views from up here will be fantastic. And an example of how the roofs are uh, supplied with photovoltaics. Moving down, this is the surface parking element of the project. Uh, it's landscaped per standards and is connected from uh, First Street to Lafayette Lane. So that's a fly through through the project. And then I'll pull up this here. This is just a uh, project uh, that Nancy had, um, the, excuse me, the sheet that, uh, that Nancy had. So as Perry had mentioned, we make many, many of the downtown specific plan uh, criteria. And the, the biggest thing that we heard during the last uh, study session with the planning commission and the design review was that we needed to get the parking underground. You saw the comparison um, sh uh, sheets and that the others we were eliminating too much of the commercial space. So this is our 29,000 square foot office space and all the parking, you can see a dashed line here of where the parking is underground. The, the parking underground is actually connected through, so you can come in and out of the first street and in and out of Mount Diablo Boulevard. And Mount Diablo Boulevard also has this other access up to the drop off and pick up. This was another item that came up during some city uh, meetings about um, how people were gonna be picked up by Uber or DoorDash or um, the small buses or something that can come to pick up uh, and help people with the, um, in, in the affordable housing element building. Um, if, if time allows, I'd like to hand the presentation over to um, Angela Provatoni um, of the Ridley or Ripley design landscape. Is that possible? I don't know what the timer's at. Um, timer's at two minutes, and I believe uh, your colleague is on the call and been okay. logged in. Is that accurate? You need to. Okay. Hi, I'm Angela oh. Pravatoni. Oh, great. Um, we're the landscape architects on the project, and um, I guess I would. Mike, would you like me to discuss yeah. the trees or the individual areas? Well, I think the, the trees first, and then yeah, we'll go okay. to the rooftops. Okay. So first on the site, um, 162 trees are, have been inventoried, and most of which are of ornamental species. 18 are natives, um, because it's the downtown location. Um, the trees are all considered protected, no matter you know the species or the size. Currently, we're showing um, 168 24 inch box trees, but since then, Inside Out has gotten back to us and said that they're we are required to have um, 539 to 604 15 gallon replacement trees, which means that we would have to up um, some of our trees, about 134 of them, to be 36. 
inch boxes to accommodate that 15 gallon tree replacement. Um, all the tree species have been chosen um, to have non-invasive roots. Um, the shrub plantings will be suitable for um, and to be planted under the oak trees that are on the adjacent properties, especially those that will be under the oak drip lines and they will be low water use and be cohesive with um, the typical plantings around and near oaks and as well as be cohesive within the project and to unite the entire planting theme of the project. Um, the project will provide, uh, the plantings will provide screening for the project from the outside, the trees. And I know that it maybe doesn't show that exactly in that fly through because it would block the buildings and the architecture, but with the trees, they're showing the screening, but the shrubs will be planted accordingly and selected as well. Um, do you want to go to the different areas with the zoom ins, Mike? I think I, that's your 10 minutes for the presentation. Um, how much more time would, I mean, you're going to have five minutes to speak to after we've um, gone through public comment. If, we could answer questions, I guess, on the individual later, Mike. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's okay. fine. Okay. Well, and actually, typically we'd ask you some questions right now too. So um, let's do it that way. Are there any questions for the applicant? Sorry, I'm having to scroll through. Um, okay, we'll do Commissioner Mason. Uh, what's the approximate size of the rooftop uh, gardens? Approximately 2,000 square feet. Actually, I was talking like per rooftop garden, each, you know, 2,000 feet per rooftop garden. I think you may have been muted, Mr. Masano. Oh. That's, that's correct. Yeah, approximately. They, they range in size um, depending on the building, but um, as you could see in the, in the fly through, they were, they were quite large with ample space. Thank you. Okay, I see Commissioner Cass. Yes, uh, could the architect explain what his scheme is on the banding? I see that it varies from building to building and the color. I don't know if the banding is a variation in color from the stucco or can you explain what's going on on the banding? Well, I think uh, what we're trying to do is we're using a number of materials to sort of um, give flavor to each of the buildings and so some of the bandings is stucco, as you pointed out, with some ribbing in it. Uh, we're using wood on some of the upper ones in that particular picture. Um, so part of this is really to sort of break up the forms and give us some, uh, some scale, especially as you walk down the Lafayette Lane itself. Um, I think... Um, each building, uh, you know, I think our palette pretty much is about four different materials that we're using. Uh, some horizontal and some uh, vertical uh, metal siding, of course, with the stucco. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the, the overall material choices. And you can see that we, we're using some different kinds of rooftops, uh, like the one in the middle is sloped there. Um, we have some flat, we have some low pitch. Um, again, to add a little bit more of a, a skyline to it uh, from offsite in particular, because it's not really seen too much as you walk down Lafayette so Lane itself. On this lower level where it's gray, is the banding actually a, a variation in color or is it just the, how you right. read it? No, there's a stripe that goes through that. So you see that about a foot stripe going through? That is yeah. a variation, yeah. And That's part of it was just, we didn't want to, we wanted to get a horizontality with it and, and to get um, some kind of enlivenment and depth to it. So those bands are actually out from the face of the stucco also. So there's some reveal to it. That was the idea anyway. 
Okay. Um, through the chair. Yes, Commissioner Sim. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Stern. Um, I have a, a couple questions for the architects. I want to start at a higher up um, uh, uh, sky or about, let's say, 10 miles up in the sky to see what your original idea generation of this project was. I get the functional issues and how to develop in a most efficient way. And there's some uh, uh, practical consideration here as well and some um, issues with the current uh, context with traffic and all. But can you give us some of your, um, the basis of your design? Um, the five buildings, they seem to have been developed around some core design principle. Can you give us a, uh, an idea of uh, what each building is doing as part of the over, overall um, uh, master plan uh, so that we can understand how each building is positioned to play that role in your overall Part G? Sure. Uh, you know, I think we started with the idea and, and actually in the original uh, study session we did of a year ago or so, the idea of a street that came from Mount Diablo and went out on First Street and that we were going to put buildings along the street and make it a pedestrian street. Um, it modified itself after we had some discussions with, well, not only a study session, but but with the fire district and where the access for automobiles should be and things such that we started to realize that there would be this sort of an elevated street with these elements where the buildings were broken into a number of parts with the hub being at the center with a community center. And then this idea of, of where you could have a drop off and that, so that's that turn in the street was, was sort of a, a crucial thing for us. Um, we realized once we did a podium kind of thing that we still wanted to keep the streets so that, that you could still have the circulation. The buildings themselves were sort of like lining the street to sort of give us some sense of scale and having units directly on the street so that their activities, their courtyards and things would enliven the street. So, so it's really trying to make this street kind of a commonality for the, for the community of, of the people in these buildings and, and to avoid making a building so big and so long that we didn't have breakups um, for, you know, vistas looking north, you know, toward uh, the hills um, or south, of course, the view down, you know, toward uh, Lafayette on the south side. Uh, that was that's kind of where we started. We and we sort of stayed with it. It was we never saw this as wanting to make a monolithic building at all. Um, so um, I, maybe that didn't explain it yeah. all. But uh, uh, just I, because I don't want to take uh, too much of your time, I just I have a lot of other things. But just I, limited to two items for me remaining. One is what the previous uh, planning commissioner uh, asked about the. Uh, direct potential connectability from the Mount Diablo uh, spine, uh, the main downtown core, uh, to uh, the uh, East Bay Mud uh, parcel on the rear. Uh, I had heard just today, just a couple of minutes ago, that there's a 10-foot uh, vertical um, control separation between the East Bay Mud point about, plus or minus, of course, to Mount Diablo. Can you share with us what other options you've attempt attempted to do to try to figure out how to connect those two from the most ideal place where the community could actually benefit rather than uh, going from the side of the first street. Can you share with us so that we can understand what the limitation was that, that we can try to see uh, if there's a possibility of still trying to make that connection more stronger for uh, the benefit of our community? The connection yeah. between Mount Diablo to the East Bay Mine. So that's one question. And just to finish off, second question is about my main concern is going to be building number two and the uh, Commons building. Those are like your elbow buildings and unique building pieces to the other three buildings. And I was uh, going to uh, ask you about what, what other options do you stay so that based on our downtown 
design guidelines uh, and other uh, uh, specific uh, uh, design criteria in our downtown. We like to see variegated forms, uh, uh, more contextual, but more informal. Uh, you know, things could spill out on that pedestrian street, as an example. I noticed that all your five buildings have no, uh, like, a porches or anything to further articulate uh, some living quality of these units. They're all just walls everywhere on the first floor. So those are two questions I have. First is the Mount Diablo East Bay Mud connection. Explain to us, demonstrate to us what other ideas you came up with, and that limited to get to where you are today. Second is... What have you studied on building number two and the commons building to demonstrate that this is the only way to go about uh, shaping those two buildings? Thank you. Yeah, the connection to the East Bay Mud um, Trail, you'll see that um, if, if we could, I wonder if, uh, you'll see that here's, here's the, um, the on-ramp and there's actually two East Bay Mud parcels um, adjacent to our project. One of the parcels is right here directly behind buildings number um, one and two. The other parcel is the one that has the aqueduct trail on it. So what we would need to do is get from our project through this first parcel, which looks like it's a um, almost a cut slope easement to build the original terrace, uh, corporate terrace, and then get through to the, the trail. So we're at one lot separated from accessing the, the trail. But with, with the allowance of actually getting onto the East Bay mud, we would, um, if, if we relocated or redesigned this game house, this would be the best access that we would have to do some um, grading and stairs. This would not be a quote unquote accessible wheelchair access. It's just the grades would prohibit that this would still be the best and most level access from El uh, Mount Apple Boulevard, elevator access to up here, all wheelchair accessible, wheelchair accessible here. Because I did see in some of the um, design, uh, the study, uh, the study, um, I can't remember what it was about the aqueduct trail, feasibility study, excuse me. Um, there were some images of uh, how, how to get uh, wheelchair access up to it. Um, but I think that there are some things about planting and being able to get and actually manipulate the grade within the East Bay mud district area, then we could accomplish that. The other, the other area really would just be between here, but you can still see we run into that slope easement right here. So I think um, with further study of the these uh, the East Bay Mud Aqueduct Trail Feasibility Study, and with working with um, the civil engineers, I'm confident we'll be able to get through and access there. And then it would be a meander or um, sort of a, a transverse access to the, you can see the trail right here. So that we have to get that, bridge that gap right there to there. Um, the, the second thing, as far as the, um, we do have on, on the plans themselves, um, we have, this is uh, addressing your comment about the, the, the decks. We do have areas that are, every unit has, has a deck and an area off uh, adjacent to Lafayette Lane. As you can see here, it didn't show up in the fly through too well, but there are actually be, between the curb and, and the, the units, there, there's some like um, buffer area and then there's the public, uh, the, the private porches and patios. So um, I think Nancy was quite clear and, and um, about the, the city's staff's request to get more pedestrian use into the Lafayette Lane and adjacent to the Lafayette Lane. And, and that would be our, our, our next development and articulation of these spaces. Uh, as to the, the elbow of the project and other options for the commons in building two, this was, um, grade it was, yeah, there's some, there's some tricky grade changes going on here between this, this access point and building number two, right? You'll see here that this is probably 
um, the, the most elevation change from here to here in the, in the project. And then we're, we're actually retaining back in here uh, for this building. The commons building location seemed to make perfect sense because it is the, the focal point of the project and in the center. So it, it also is directly across from our drop off and pick up and accessible and equidistance pretty much from all the buildings. So that, that just sort of um, developed after we, we got this center um, access, the pedestrian path developed connecting it to the building sort of started to flank on either side of that uh, uh, Lafayette Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Stern. Thank you. Um, since we, we've been talking about this connection to the East, Mud, East Bay Mud Aqueduct Trail, I, I, um, if we could look at the, the Google Earth view of it, that might help us get a better understanding of the grades we're talking about. Are you seeing Google Earth, Chair? Yes. Okay, very good. So uh, the Safeway, Whole Foods, and then the, the project site and the uh, architect was able to submit a, a three-dimensional model export, uh, which is displaying in Google Earth here. So um, the, the two parcels, the, this longer parcel, and you can see it continuing east-west, uh, that is where the, the two pipelines exist. And um, Mr. Masano was speaking to where the cursor is going in right now. This kind of separate parcel, it's all East Bay mud land. However, um, it is for some reason a separate quote unquote parcel. And then um, once we go into kind of three dimensionality of it, um, we concur that there are, are topographic challenges that would be uh, need to be overcome in order to provide direct access from the rear, the north edge of this project site um, to an improved aqueduct trail. So the, the trail does descend kind of along the lines of the, the on-ramp, or rather the on-ramp is ascending from uh, First Street as does the, uh, the existing utility driveway. And um, then there, there's a steeper cut slope, I think Mr. Masanda described it as. And so um, I think it would behoove staff and, and the project team to look at projects that have uh, been previously approved and, and um, conditioned to improve the aqueduct trail at the, at the west end of town, including Lennar, which faced a similar um, topographic change um, and, and the direction from the commissions at that point was to connect the, uh, the pedestrian mu um, through the site and, and access the aqueduct trail um, and that they were able to achieve that. And then the most recently, uh, certainly Woodbury Highlands, uh, Woodbury was I think the first project that, that did uh, a segment, the adjacent segment of the aqueduct trail. Um, Lennar being second, I think, and third and most recent is Woodbury Highlands, which sits well above the aqueduct trail. And in order to connect that project of 99 units um, to the, the pedestrian connection that is the aqueduct trail, um, they've installed some retaining walls and, and a little bit of a, of a, a traversing path um, to connect those two. So I think with those examples and the, the project team and, and civil engineer and architect, we're, um, we can probably bring back a, uh, a potential solution. Um, um, thank you. Is there I, more in Google Earth that you would like to? Well, I actually have a, I have a couple questions if you sure. want to keep it open. Yeah. Um, I know there are different solutions for crossing roads. Can you remind us what the idea was cross for the trail crossing First Street. With respect to the Aqueduct Trail, I, d I don't have that uh, in mind. We can certainly uh, look that up. Um, I know that the plan envisioned in a long-term fashion uh, pedestrian bridges, but there is a, uh, a certainly a cost and and uh, design uh, hurdle to be. Uh, hurdled with that. So um, 
I, a, I would, I'll look at the, we'll look at the plan, um, okay. the aqueduct feasibility study and um, bring back what, it, what that envisioned at this location. Okay. Um, Nancy may have looked at more recently than I um, and may be able to speak to that, but if not, we can certainly bring that back to you. Hey, Greg, could you go back to the plan view showing the topography? And see how the con um, see how those contours are angling to the northeast. Mm -hmm. They're not. Um, if if you were to try to leave the site and go due due north perpendicular to the yeah that those contours there. If you were to try to leave the site and go perpendicular to the trail, just head straight to it. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have topographic challenges, and you're gonna be fighting grades, trying to meet ADA, um, ADA slopes. And my, my thought is, and, and I think you, you made a good point. My thought is uh, the engineers and the architects can put their heads together. And as you're moving your cursor like that along the contour, the trail could angle over to the, to the, um, the existing trail and you could follow that contour and be relatively flat. So I think you would, help yourself by by angling over. Agreed. Yeah, my, my thought was that if probably, well, if people cycling and wanting to cycle through the site and use the trail to go to BART, for example, would come down the, or come up the east side of the, the site and through the bollards at the drop-off area. And then if if um, coming up to the trail wasn't sort of a switchback um, accessible ramp, then you know, if, if there was a way to make it more of a smooth you know, linear transition doing what Commissioner Heising just described, then that would be a logical way for them to go. Otherwise, I was thinking if for whatever reason, if the slopes can't be dealt with there for a ramp, I wouldn't be opposed to having access along first street and then some kind of stairs if that's if that's a possibility um in the you know in the center connection location where the game house is yeah and so if there is a connection made um from lafayette lane um we would need to understand what the ada requirements are with respect to that i don't know if it would be um if it would meet ADA requirements to have the the going okay. out to the west be be the uh, accessible path and um, non accessible path straight up from north from Lafayette Lane, but okay. um, we will look at that further. Does the feasibility? Well, maybe we don't. This might be another question where you just, I need to give you time to look at the at the feasibility study again. Um, I would just, I'd be interested to, and I think I have a copy of it somewhere, so I'll look at it too. But I'd be interested to know whether it has, we have um, design guidelines and or criteria for lighting and paving and stuff like that. I, I think we must, because there needs to be, you know, there's been continuity between the, the sections that have already been constructed. Yeah, this is actually a very good segue into the next meeting with Trans Transportation and Circulation yeah. Commission. So this is great questions to be able to prepare for that discussion at the next meeting. Okay, great. So if people are feeling they have a number of, or are there any other questions? I was thinking if there are a number of questions, maybe we focus on building and then move into landscape. Um, okay, I see Commissioner Gray had your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I've got a question uh, uh, for the design team regarding the design of the central street. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, clearly it's vehicle scale uh, I'm assuming it's a required fire lane. Uh, is it designed to the minimum for fire lane? Um, uh, and, is, and does fire lane require that much basically hard scape surface? Uh, and then a second question that's not as much a concern. I just, I couldn't find an accessible connection between the lower plaza and Lafayette Lane. And I'm just hoping there is an accessible pathway there. Uh, yes, thank you. The, um, the fire district requirements for buildings over a certain height require 26 foot of 
pavement. And we were trying to even go with turf blocks, but they said no pavement. Mm -hmm. And then 15 feet adjacent to that before you hit the building, in order to uh, have the ladder apparatus swing around and access the building. So we have a 26 foot and then 15 and then 15. So it's, um, it, 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 it'll, it made the center nice as far as the scale and the separation between, uh, between the buildings. Um, we will have to go with a, um, a higher rating of construction type uh, for the, the back, because of the back sides aren't directly accessible with a fire apparatus. Uh, uh, um, you know, one that can actually get a ladder from a fire truck up to the, the roof. So, but those, uh, we, we went back and forth several times about the requirements for the fire district, the turning radius and uh, the, the side aisle access. That's the thing that really um, had the effect on the width. Yeah, we wanted turf stone. That's yeah. what we wanted. Yeah, but they 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 just they wouldn't go for it. And don't allow it. I just don't. Okay, that does answer my that. question. How about the question on the accessible uh, connection? Yeah, the accessible. Um, if I could take the screen back, um, do I share screen? You should be able to. Yes. Okay. Okay. We have on the um, there's there's several ways. Okay, if you're on Mount Apple Boulevard, um, there are several ways. There's a, an elevator in this entry lobby here that accesses the plaza here. Once you get on the plaza, there's an elevator right in this corner that can access the um, Lafayette Lane. And so that's why this is a transition level between Mount Apple Boulevard and Lafayette Lane. You can also come adjacent to this building back to the parking level or the podium. And there's an elevator there that the same one that has this half level, the elevator here accesses the uh, Lafayette Lane through this way. So yes, it does have, um, we, we have elevators for each of the buildings um, that come up within the buildings. Um, and then several elevators for each, uh, one for each side of the commercial space that uh, also for um, access from Mount Diablo. And then we have one between the buildings to handle this half level here. Thank you. You're welcome. So, but there's no, there's no ramp access. Somebody would need an elevator to get. Yeah, the, the ramps with the, the, the code and stuff to get up uh, from, from we, we would need a ramp in excess of 120 feet to get up just to the plaza level and then another 55 or 60 feet to get from here to here. It just, uh, it's, it's not feasible to uh, provide ramp access. But once you're on this area, this is all handicap accessible. With the, we, we spent a lot of time developing this slope um, just to the point where um, we, could, we could make the um, level up here at, from the first street to all of the, the transition between Mount Diablo, the plaza, and Lafayette Lanes, and this. There's, there's a lot happening right in the center here, but it's all uh, handicap accessible as far as slope goes. And if you're, it looks like there's not necessarily a designated pedestrian pathway up the um, little side street to the drop off area. Is that, that's not an accessible slope? No. No, this is not an accessible slope. This is for vehicle um, uh, driving up, picking up and turning around and leaving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have other questions for the applicant? Commissioner Maggio? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I wonder if the architect could talk a little bit about the affordable housing unit. We've received quite a few comments from the public and I saw a lot of comment in, in the, uh, the last joint session about all of the housing relegated to one building. If you could please uh, speak to the, the need to do that. Um, if I may. Dispersing uh, the housing throughout the units. If I may, Commissioner, this is Perry Harari. Um, oh, yes. I'll talk about it a little bit, but um, later on for public comment, we'll have Rosemary Kerbach with some flower come and speak and 
describe that a little more. But uh, the main, and we submitted a, a narrative uh, description of uh, the reasons uh, why they have to be that way, but I'll just give a high level overview. Uh, one, um, in order to get uh, affordable housing projects uh, financed, um, you need to have them uh, congregated in one building, typically. These are gonna be very low income uh, dis disabled adults um, with de 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 developmental disabilities, I should say. And so um, the income level is very low and they need substantial um, tax credit subsidies and other kinds of bond financings and so forth. The other thing is um, the services that these particular residents require um, have to be provided on site. There's gonna be on site supervision. There are certain size of units for the most part. Um, they're single units. Um, there is an on site supervisor residence. There's community dining. There's community activity rooms. So, all these things kind of um, require for all the units to be congregated together. So this affordable housing isn't for say teachers or other members of the community. It's for a very specific group of people. Correct, correct. And um, it's very specific group of people. When talking to some of the community members, um, a group called Sunflower, which originated from a Lafayette resident reached out to us about the need in Lafayette for the particular, uh, the resident group. Uh, adults with de developmental disabilities. Um, there's, uh, there are services for those when they're younger, but when they become adults, uh, it becomes very difficult to provide housing. So this is a very unique opportunity to do that. And I think Rosemary will speak to that. She is a 25 year resident of Lafayette and she'll come up and speak at public, public comment. Actually, I, I did include Rosemary on on one of the people available. So I don't know if, if uh, Greg, if you do you see Rosemary on that list? I do. And uh, I'm bringing her in now. And if we'll, we'll stop the screen share so uh, everyone can see one another. Can I, can I ask questions before Rosemary um, addresses this, if I may? Sure. Um, so I, I was one of the uh, commissioners during the last meeting who had a huge issue about having a building where you would segregate a group of people for affordable housing. So put that on the record again. I, I know you and I had some, I had some questions for you and you answered them, um, Perry, the last time. Sure. So first of all, I appreciate the number of very low affordable housing. I think that's great. I also like the, and I also appreciate the idea of you looking out for this group of people because it's hard to find housing. I think that's great too. I still have this issue about putting everyone into one building. Um, and I saw, uh, I read very thoroughly the reasons for it. And I'm still, I, I still can't get there to be, on, to be, to be frank with you. Um, so one question I have, I'll ask some questions and I'll do some commentary later. Is there going to be actual professional super, supervisory staff living there? Well, because I read a couple of different things. You just said there would be, but in the report, it says the building manager would supervise those individuals. And I would assume that's not gonna be a professional who would know how to deal with special issues people might have in that building. So it's a compound question. <laughs> yeah, for um, Rosemary, this is something that Rosemary can describe in detail. And I, my understanding is, I mean, they're the operators. They are professional um, caregivers for this particular resident group. But again, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'll let her describe them. And again, um, the you know, we just did this in the city of Mountain View um, last year. We did teacher housing. 144 units in one building. And the only reason we were able to do that was that they were together so they could be financed um, separately. Uh, it allows them to be financed. If they were not 
congregated together, we couldn't serve this one particular resident class. Um, you might be able to provide other types of affordable housing. We certainly couldn't do 30% of the base density, uh, which we are now. It's twice what the code requires, which is 15%. So we're offering 30%. So that, that's what allows us to do this, to serve this particular resident group and capitalize it. If we didn't do this, we wouldn't be able to do that. So maybe Rosemary can describe um, the residents and the services provided. That might be a lot more helpful. Thanks. I have, I, I'll have a, I have a couple other questions on the financing for you, but okay. thank you. Welcome, Rosemary. Great. Okay, perfect. I want to make sure. Uh, first, I wanted to clarify um, an earlier screenshot of a public comment that said that I was um, opposed to the aggregate housing um, and apologize for any confusion with the video I sent you of our Moonlight in the Vine, Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch, but um, I am 100% and Sunflower Hill is 100% of having all the residents in building one. And indeed that is our model at Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch and is a model throughout California um, and in um, and, and communities actually across the United States. So, um, so hopefully you can, you can, you can um, make, that, make that clear in the comments. So uh, Sunflower Hill's mission is to create spaces and places where adults with developmental disabilities can live, work, learn, and thrive as part of the greater community an emphasis as part of the greater community. So I became involved with Sunflower Hill in early 2013. Um, and we knew there was a dearth of opportunities. Group homes were closing down. You know, a lot of us who had high school or young adults with developmental disabilities faced the question, what's gonna happen to my child when I die or am no longer able to take care of them? And that is a very sobering question to face as a parent, let me tell you. Um, so I be, there was a group of parents in Pleasanton, the Tri-Valley area that were, I, I had a little group in Lafayette and they had a group and we, we joined groups. So we started working together in 2013 and our founder was Susan Houghton. So she started the organization and I worked closely with her. And for the first few years, we did research. We didn't know what we wanted. Um, so we really looked, do we want to go the affordable housing route or the private route? We decided against private because there are private places that are $5,000 per month. And imagine that over a lifespan. I mean, a college tuition is hard enough for four years. Can you imagine paying that for 50 something years? Um, so we quickly decided not to go private. And then we really were, you know, what, what is gonna be our model? And so we, we did research. We looked, like I said, across the country, we looked at other communities. Um, uh, there's one that's being built right now, Villa De Vida in Poway, that will complete in December. 53 units, 100% DD, all 53 project vouchers. The rent there is $273. For, for the residents there. And following up on what Perry said, that's because it's TCAC financed and to get vouchers, you need a separate parcel there. We looked on the, pri I mean, Friends of Children with Special Needs, these are private ones, uh, so, uh, in Fremont, Sweetwater Spectrum in Sonoma, Casa de Ama and Glenwood down in Southern California. Um, and many of those, there's a wait list to get on the wait list. Um, so we had four community meetings and got input from hundreds of residents um, or potential residents with developmental disabilities. And this was the clear consensus. Um, so that, that's kind of the model that, we, that we, we did at Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch. It clearly resonated. We just opened last month and we had over 300 applicants for 29 spots. Villa De Vida, my understanding is, is they have a close to a thousand applicants for 53 spots. Um, so I talked briefly about, you know, our Irby Ranch project. And I also, if there's further questions, Kathy Lehman, our board president, and Edie Nails, our executive director, and I know Iman Novin uh, are, are on the call as well. Um, our Irby Ranch project was over $25 million 
for those 29 uh, units. And it was all publicly financed. And, you know, every resident is paying an affordable rent between 20 and 50% AMI. Um, our model is akin to senior living. Um, and, you know, nobody questions seniors living together. And in many ways, our residents, sometimes their needs can parallel seniors with needing a little bit extra support. Um, I also can make the analogy uh, to freshmen in college. I just said, you know, I've, I've had two, two in, the, in the dorms. Um, and again, it, it takes some time to figure out how to live independently. And, and like I said, with, the, with freshmen in the dorms, there's an RA, there is support. Um, uh, before they can, you know, m move out or, you know, my, my sons were in the dorms two years before they ultimately moved in, into apartments in their college communities. Um, from a services perspective, um, we, we are working very closely and have the support at Irby of the Regional Center of uh, East Bay. Our model, we have an economies of scale and to answer um, a question on site, uh, in Lafayette Lane would be a full-time property manager as well as a full-time Sunflower Hill activities kind of, you know, co uh, uh, manager. Those two would be on site in free apartments. Um, and obviously they'd, they'd get a salary as well. The in, For anybody that needed additional services, there's both SLS, Supportive Living Services, and ILS, Independent Living Services, that are provided by the Regional Center of the East Bay. And Edie, our executive director, who's on, on, on this call as well, if anybody has further information, she is working closely um, with the Regional Center of the East Bay to make sure our residents at Irby get, get services, the services that they need and uh, are, you know, are provided by the uh, Regional Center. Um, and the other comment that I just like to make, um, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast um, out of, uh, Pennsylvania is a controversial state in many ways, but it's very controversial from the disability perspective. Um, Pennsylvania has taken the perspective that they won't let more than X number, I think it's six, of individuals with disabilities live together. Um, and there's, there's a, a body of disability advocates that believe that there's some ableism, um, that people with disabilities should have the choice to be able to live together. Um, my son, Patrick, has, from the time he was three, been in the special, you know, in the early intervention program at Burton Valley. He was in the special day class um, all through Lafayette, you know, um, played on the Lafayette Little League Challenger team, um, uh, swims to be the East Bay Sea Serpents. These are his friends. These are his buds, his peeps. Why can't he live with them? That's who he wants to live with. I mean, that's the whole purpose when you think about it of even Special Olympics. You're with athletes that are, you know, have, have various levels of, of disability. Um, I understand that there's different models and everybody, there, there's choice. We're not forcing anybody to live at Sunflower Hill, but we must be doing something right if over 300 people applied. Um, and my heart breaks for those 270 families that didn't get in. I know there is a lot of support. Um, I know people who are even listening to this call. Um, and, and frankly, I've been really under the radar um, with Lafayette with, with this project. Um, uh, because you know we we we've, we we were working out some um, other uh, administrative things, but I know we're going to have great support from this from the community. I know there are a lot of Lafayette families that wanted to live at Sunflower Hill in Irby, um, and either didn't get in or didn't want to move their child all the way to Pleasanton. I know multiple families that have moved out of state and down to Southern California. And you know, my, my attitude is just like every community has senior living, every community should have special needs living. And um, I think that is it, unless anybody has any questions. Um, and like I said, I mean, I, I, if I missed anything, I would really ask our executive director Edie and um, our board president, Kathy Lehman, um, 
to, um, to uh, add in. And I'd also just like to say to anybody, we, we was, you saw, you know, I sent the virtual tour of the video. If anybody has any questions or wants to see a Sunflower Hill in action, we, we can make that happen at Irby Ranch. Um, Edia, I'm sure can coordinate that, but okay, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That was a helpful presentation. <laughs> it wasn't only a presentation, but helpful discussion. Um, Commissioner Farsan, did you have any follow-up questions? No, I mean, I'm in favor uh, of it completely. And that's, the, just want to be clear here. I, I think it gets to that last part you, that you said about choice. I would like to have somebody who wants to live there with special needs to have a choice to not live in building one is kind of my, my point, like somebody have the choice of saying, I don't want to only live in this building. But if, if that's not going to be possible, I definitely would don't want to do that because I want to have as many units as possible to be able to do that. But I also live in a world where I want to give people choice. And I don't want to feel like they're being segregated into a building. Right. And, and typically, uh, Commissioner, we you know, we've done all kinds of models and usually we do have uh, integrated affordable units in a building and those residents don't have special needs or disabilities. Uh, they just have lower income. So they are perfectly capable of, you know, living, you know, it's, it's not an issue. This particular group of residents uh, cannot live on their own for the most part. They do need some assistance um, and they typically, they don't, drive so they don't need as much parking and they're usually again um, live in uh, one bedroom units um, they do have some uh, communal dining and communal activities so we could do that but we just wouldn't be able to serve this population and not as many units we we are providing twice as many bedrooms as we would have offered your rooms in, mm -hmm. um, as um, if we were to do integrated ones and 15, um, 15 units integrated through the project, similar to the other ones. So we are offering a lot more bedrooms than we ordinarily would have offered and serving a lot more people. And I just want to make the point again that our residents don't view it as segregated. They view it as living with their peers. Um, and there's ample opportunities for engagement with the community at large. And there certainly would be at Lafayette Lane. Thank you. I hope that Rosemary, you would think uh, some is. of them, some of their parents or relatives would be able to live there in Lafayette Lane and close to their, you know, their kids or relatives that live in the other units. Okay, um, I wanna make sure that we get to public comment before it's too late. I have a few questions. Do any other commissioners have questions on the architecture or landscaping? You see Commissioner LaBonge? Uh, actually, I was gonna question what we were just discussing. So if you oh, wanna sure. limit it to landscaping and architecture, I'll, I'll well, wait. Well, I think it's easier when we stay on topic. So go ahead. Um, Thanks for the overview, Rosemary. That was this is this is new for me, so it's kind of learning. I I like to look at these um, from you know the business perspective and try to understand. And and I definitely believe it's a need, and I I, I support the idea of being in a single building. Um, I I do want to understand though, and I'm not trying to be skeptical, but just I want to understand because I think it's important for everyone to understand this. What keeps this building from three years from now saying, ah, you know, we didn't like the disability thing. Let's just go back to low income. And, and in a sense, circumventing, kind of congregating everyone, because if we weren't talking disability needs here, we would probably as a group say, no, this has to be dispersed amongst the buildings like we did before. So what, what's the guard against that other than you're good people and you're gonna do the right thing? Um, and I'm going to ask Iman to yeah. jump on to answer that because the, we, we would get TCAC low income housing tax credits. That would be a big financing source. Um, and my understanding is it's a restricted 55 year deed um, yeah. for the project. So that, yeah, we have our, and, and, you know, even. Yeah. 
I'm sorry to interrupt, Rosemary. We do have our ladies council here, uh, Patty Curtin and Todd Williams. But typically on these types of deals, you would have a recorded recorded uh, deed restriction, recorded covenant that precludes you from changing its use. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm imagining that's what's happening here as well. So, so it would run with the land for- Exactly, for 55 years. years. Okay. Yep. And then just another business question. Um, and I do, again, I, I do like this idea. Um, what does that, what does that do from the development side for the rest of the people you're trying to attract to this? I know some people could be family members, but surely not the entire rest of the development is going to be developed yeah. out for the benefit of, of building one and the residents of that. Is that just, you, you just believe, and I, I kind of hope this is it, that people understand that that's part of the community. So there's not going to be an aversion to that. I mean, exactly. I mean, this is part of the community. It's a, it's a group of the community that needs housing and needs to be served. And I think um, I, I, I watched uh, Rosemary's other project. I went and uh, observed it. And I think they've become a really uh, key part of that community. They've developed friendships with the market rate housing residents at the Irby Ranch one. And I can, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to Rosemary about this. And, um, you know, I think it'll be uh, perceived as a, a community benefit. I think I think it'll be perceived as a positive thing by the residents that live there. And if, you know, if some people don't like it, they don't like it. I mean, we, we may lose some, some folks that don't want that uh, association, but I think majority of people will appreciate it. Thank you. If I can pipe in for a second, we were we we thought the same thing might happen at Irby Ranch, and the, the market rate housing went first. Um, it was just a little, tiny bit uh, scheduled ahead of us, and we were pleasantly surprised when the homes that bordered Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch sold first. So it warms uh, my heart. Yeah. Greg, do you know, I know we have other housing further, I think it's further to the west, um, downtown that also serves this population. Do you know how the, those units that are available to them are configured within the larger project? Um, I know that the town center project, the first residential phase of town center um, serves adults with physical disabilities. Um, and that was a choice uh, to pursue tax credit financing um, in large part because of the proximity to public transit right there next to the BART station. So um, that that is perpetuated and memorialized in a in the TCAC uh, financing and um, the affordable housing uh, deed restrictions, which are recorded. So um, in that project, there are, there's no um, additional care or, or services needed for those residents. They just may be um, uh, in some way, shape or form um, physically disabled and have, have challenges with mobility. So the uh, developer and, and manager of the project, um, as units come up, um, so they, they, it's not, they're not congregated in, in one location, one building, they are mixed throughout and it's not even specific units is my understanding. It's um, kind of on a rotating basis. Um, so any of the units, they're all accessible. And, and as units become available, they're, they're serving that community, that cohort with uh, I think 20% of the, of the overall units. Okay, so you're and you're saying that that population has physical special needs only. That's my understanding. Yes. So I don't maybe Rosemary, maybe you know, I thought there was a another housing development downtown that served um, individuals with cognitive special needs because I see a group of folks with um, like a counselor downtown quite often, and I, and I just assume that they live downtown. Um. I, do, I, I know, Patty, maybe you want to jump on or someone from Las Trumpas. I believe Las Trumpas has some residential homes. Um, 
I'm not sure how many they have. And I believe uh, Kathy and Dan are, are um, on for public comment. So um, they can maybe clarify um, your, they, they, they're they probably better able to answer your, your question than me. Okay, maybe they can jump on for public comment. And they do a great, yeah, they do a great, um, uh, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I, I know people in their day program that are just, you know, really, really happy with that. So um, I think potentially we could have a great synergy. Yeah, we always, my kids and I always enjoyed seeing them at the library and walking down Mount Diablo. Um, Commissioner Farsad, did you have another question? No, I was going to say, I think it's the day program of okay, that, that you're seeing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Commissioner Heising. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, my questions were not relative to landscaping. Um, so is now the appropriate time? Sure, I mean, I think we're nearing the end of the questions. I just, after we launched into it, I thought oh, it would be good to sort of go through all the architectural questions and then landscaping, but feel free to ask whatever's on your Okay, um, so my question, um, my first question is about the current occupancy of the, of the commercial um, site. I know this came in and up in a prior study session. And while I appreciate the increase from 10,000 square feet to 29,000 square feet of commercial, I believe the existing sites like 82 or 85. So to give me a sense of how much we're losing, what's the current occupancy of the, of the site relative to the 29,000 square feet? Perry, can you chime in on that? Well, what was the, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question again? Couldn't quite hear it. Yeah, what's the current occupancy? While I appreciate the, mm -hmm. the projects increasing from 10,000 square feet to 29, what's current occupancy so I can get a flavor of how much commercial square footage we're losing? Yes, yeah, so the current uh, total square footage is 81,000 square feet. Um, we've got a fair amount of uh, vacancy. I, I want to say uh, at least uh, twenty percent, so maybe fifteen thousand square feet. I'll have to double check and get back to you on that maybe during this call. But um, and we've had a really hard time leasing this. We would have loved to have leased this, but it is an older building. It's seventies architecture. Um, a lot of the vacancies toward the back against the hill. Um, and it's kind of dark and damp and without any views. And it's just the, the, the taste of tenants today are very different than they were 50 years ago. They just like a different type of office experience. They want more open space, um, much lighter. These are a lot of private offices, uh, you know, lower ceilings and so forth. So the new building will be, you know, state of the art very attractive, probably the nicest commercial office building in Lafayette. So we're pretty excited about that and work pretty hard with the city to try to accomplish that at the front of the project. So the, the reality is not, it, these aren't the most attractive uh, professional spaces currently and we've had a really hard time leasing the vacancy. Yeah, and the reason, I mean, the reason I'm bringing it up is I remember at the prior study session, there were, um, there were um, commercial businesses that left the Woodbury site after Woodbury was developed. A lot of them came over to your site, and there were and there were a number of those people that were concerned that that it was going to force local commercial businesses out of Lafayette and have to go find um, places out out of town. So um, yep. th thanks thanks for that. I appreciate that. And then my other question um, is more around the, the waivers and concessions. So um, are we gonna have Wendell Rosen come on later or should I ask my question now? It's up to Greg, yeah, they're available, they're on. Okay, so my question is, um, I read the Wendell Rosen letter. I, I understand and completely get the, um, the um, the waiver and the concessions and the difference between the two. And um, when I read the Wendell Rosen letter, it, when speaking specifically to the fifth, the fifth story, I'll just say it, I'm not a big fan of 
the extra stories and having four stories on top of podium parking and having a five story building, I'm not a fan of. However, I do understand um, the law and the density bonus law is what I'm referring to. So when two of the waivers, one is for the fifth story and one is for the reduced floor area um, on, the, on the floors above, and they're both being invoked with a waiver, those, those are being called out as a waiver. Mm -hmm. And in the Wendell Rosen letter, it says, um, without being granted the waiver, this would physically preclude the development um, with being allowed to offer the, the bonus the bonus density. I just, can I just understand, I mean, it's it's one thing to say that, but can I understand how it physically precludes the building from building th that number of units when in my mind, you could just build smaller units, not have a fifth floor and still have the, um, still get your, your, your bonus, your extra units. Um, but, well, just for yeah. the benefit of those on the on the call in the meeting, um, I was waiting until the completion of the question in order to bring in the Wendell Rosen folks. Uh, there is a, a no man's land uh, mm -hmm. uh, during the transition, and and they're not able to hear. So I wanted to wait for that. But okay. um, Ms. Curtin is here, and Mr. Um, Williams. Yeah, Todd. Yeah. I, he just went away, but uh, by the I'll way, I do have. It. I'll find them and let them in. The, uh, I do have an answer to the occupancy. We're all, we have 28% vacancy, so it's only 72% occupied. And I'll let Todd answer that. Um, I don't. We don't. We don't have five stories. I don't believe. Um, but yeah, four four on top of the parking. Yeah, four on top of the parking. Um, and I'll let Todd explain it. I mean, we we wouldn't be able to do the same project. Um, with the same units and the same experience uh, with, you know, lopping off a whole, whole level. It just, it wouldn't allow us to make it feasible enough to provide 30%, um, donate a big portion of the property for affordable housing and do the 30% affordable housing if we were to do far less uh, market rate units. It just wouldn't make the project feasible. So, um, but so that's it has to be, how would it physically preclude it though? It has to be it, the, my understanding of how the density bonus law works is you have to, you have to prove that it would physically preclude you from building the project if you didn't get that extra story. And I'm, so I'm just posing the question, if the units were smaller, could you achieve the same number of units with if, if each unit was uh, proportionally or, or fractionally uh, lower square footage, could you get the same number of units, smaller unit, albeit they would be smaller units, could you get it with three stories on top of the podium parking? I'm, I'm gonna let Todd explain that, uh, Wendell Rosen, and there's a, I don't wanna make, mess up the technical um, distinction there. Um, Todd, are you available? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, the short answer to your question is, is the density bonus law doesn't require you to reduce the size of your proposed project in order to squeeze more units into a smaller space. So you're, you're allowed to propose your project in the unit mix that you, uh, that you want to do. You provide the requisite amount of affordable housing. You get the... Uh, the resulting density bonus, uh, you get your, you know, look at your other concessions that you might be getting. Uh, and then at that point, you uh, your project essentially fits on the site within the boxes that the zoning allows in terms of height and setback, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, ultimately it's the architect who can tell us whether the units can be fit on the site, but there's, there's simply nothing in the law that says, uh, well, geez, if you just made it all studios or micro units, you wouldn't need that extra height. So we're going to force you to do that. So are you saying that the um, square footage of the units are tied to um, tied to money? And then isn't money, concessions are tied to money, not waivers. 
So I'm trying to understand Correct. if if the city were to ask for the units to be smaller and the developer's position is, no, we don't wanna make those units smaller because we're gonna make less money. That's a, that's a concession, not a waiver. And the concessions are usually tied to fees or something. So I guess I'm struggling with understanding how you can build whatever size units you want and get that extra story as a waiver. I think I would just say that the density bonus law is structured in a way to incentivize uh, the provision of affordable housing by allowing the project to be proposed, you know, as consistent with the zoning. So, you know, we couldn't come in and say we want, I don't think, I, I'm not sure the specifics of, of Lafayette's code, but say we want to build 10 bedroom units or something that's not consistent with the code, but we're allowed to do, you know, propose a mix of ones and twos and studios or however uh, mix that we're proposing. Uh, and then, you know, as long as we're meeting those as, as a base project, as long as we're meeting uh, zoning and then able to provide the affordable units and do the density on top of that. And there's really not a mechanism in the law that says that, uh, that a city can reject a waiver by requiring um, the project proponent to um, make the units smaller you know, basically to change their business plan and to do it in a different way. So yeah, and in, in, in you were correct that there's a distinction between concessions and waivers. And the main distinction is that concessions, you need to show that your resulting cost savings and for waivers, you don't. It really is a question of, is the project that you're proposing going to be able to fit within the development standards? And if not, then the city must uh, waive those standards in order to accommodate the project, not sort of the other way around. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think you explained it pretty well, Todd, as far as we wanted to do this project, we can't do this project with, uh, and we were entitled to do this project with the current zoning. Um, were it not for providing these affordable units. So we can't really do that project unless we had the extra level. Um, so I, I think what Todd is trying to explain is we shouldn't be forced to make a whole different project or smaller project that's not, uh, viable so that we can provide the units. It should be the other way around. We're providing the units. And so there needs to be some waiver in the development standards to allow us to do the project we would have wanted to do. Yeah, understood. So, yeah. I mean, I get it. You shouldn't be forced to build a project you don't want to build. But then the flip side, the city's being forced to approve a project taller than they would maybe like. So somebody loses. I can chime in on that. The, the, average, the average unit is around 1,100 square feet, which is not abnormally large. I mean, if we had really large units, I think that that argument would, would be would hold water. But in our case, these are pretty typical units. And what Todd is saying is in order to get as the, the number of units on there, we have to go up. So it, it's, yes, indirectly it's connected to cost, but our units are typical. So in order to get that number of typical units, we have to have another level in order to get as many as we need uh, for our density uh, I mean, bonus. Exactly. I mean, we wouldn't be able to take advantage of the density bonus law if we didn't do those units. So it, become, it makes the law moot. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Um, Heising, is that you have more yeah, questions? Yeah, Madam Chair, I had, um, I had, I had questions regarding the um, transportation um, analysis, impact analysis. Can, um, I, think, they, I think what we're, we're focusing on the design tonight okay. since we have our joint meeting okay so unless unless you can sort of think through no, it that's fine. you think it's going to have some impact on the design then maybe we'll we'll save those comments or yeah, questions I, from the next I can meeting. do that okay. yep cool. all right um commissioner labange uh, i was just wondering uh greg could you because you were able to put up the three-dimensional 
on Google. Are you able to do that from Mount Diablo Boulevard and look from average person height north and especially relative to the massing to the right of the, you know, so we could see the relative size of this as you were to, you know, look across, not just this by itself. I, I'm trying to see how in scale this is going to be to the property to the east of it. That's, and I, I maybe it doesn't matter, but to Commissioner Heising's question, I, I, I think it's important for people on this in the public to realize the constraints that the state is putting on the city um, and the commission on, on handcuffing some of the decisions. And I think what Commissioner Heising was saying about, you know, well, the city does, you know, has a height limit that is getting blown up and the city can't do anything about it. And I mean, obviously, if you read the comments, you, you can see people are frustrated and feel this is being ignored. And, I, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I know all the commissioners are acutely aware of this and there's certain things we're dealing with. So while Greg, if you could put that up, but I'm just going to talk one more <laughs> while you're doing well, that. Commissioner Labonge, actually, we're still in the question period. And we, if we do have people that want to make public comment, they, they've been waiting well, until almost 9 o'clock. Yeah, I know. But I think this is very important because this is, this is a, I mean, we've dealt with this in every big development we've had is how out of scale they are. And so I think, I think it's only fair that you can see the scale because you can't see the scale from oh. a plan view. Yes, yes. yes. I'm, fi I'm fine with um Greg pulling up the 3D image, I think that was a great suggestion. I'm just saying if you want to speak more, with, if you have more comments regarding this issue, if you can save them to the deliberation yeah. section of the meeting. That's fine. That's um, fine. But, um, well, let me, this is a real little question. Um, I just, and it, I, I wasn't really clear, and maybe after Greg does this, I wanted to be clear that you can't cut through this development from the way I understand how cars can go. So once we get through this, if maybe the applicant could just confirm that, you would you would have to go through the garage and then pop out on the first street side. And I'm assuming there's some key cards or something because I was, I've always been concerned that people would cut through, but it, I think with the bollards you described, there's no way to cut through now, which I think is good. I just want you guys to confirm that. Um, and while Greg pulls that up, I, I had a quick question that's in this view for either, I guess, either you or Nancy. Um, I, in one of the documents that was in the packet, I thought it mentioned improvements to the medians. Oh, the medians shortened. Is that, I, I wasn't sh sure exactly what the changes to the medians were, but. So to answer the question, uh... You know, Google Earth is is free, and um, so we're able to display it in, in this. Uh, you can see that there, there it's a good but imperfect uh, application. In that, you know, you can see up the lane there's a remnant of an existing building that we we have no ability to delete uh, in this platform. Um, but it does allow, from an aerial view, a pretty fair to good. Uh, representation of it, you know, it, it's it's good. I'll say from uh, from this vantage point, it does it, it has greater deficiencies when we go down to street view uh, level. Um, what happens is it slips into um, Google's street view imagery, um, and we do have the option to toggle over to the ground level view, which then renders that three-dimensional, uh, those three-dimensional polygons. So that is kind of representative of what one would see, um, just those polygons rendered three-dimensionally from that vantage point on the surface of the earth. Um, but the, the rendering of it, you can see is, is uh, not the greatest. And so what it does then is actually um, pose so I'll, I'll suggest that Mr. Masano may have put together some um, better photo sims of the building um, at Mount Diablo Boulevard within its uh, kind of street view context. So I'll invite him. Great, Greg, do you have a sense of how many public comments we might have? Um, Currently, 24 attendees, uh, one hand up. I, you know, if we if we did uh, all of them, 
that's a little over an hour, but um, it remains to be seen whether every person would take a full three minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Masano, is that something you can pull up or do you wanna do that when we come back to you after public comment? You're, you're, on, you're muted. Oh, still muted. Oh, uh, can you hear me? I'm yes. Okay. Yeah. Can I take the screen back? Sure. Uh, you should be able to. Okay. Yeah. So it, uh, I understand what you're talking about. Uh, we do have a couple renderings from Mount Diablo Boulevard. I don't know if it answers the question that the commissioner was asking, but um, with the model now, uh, there's a limit to how much of the other yeah, okay. yeah. area we can actually, yeah, you can't really see because of the huge trees on that other parcel. Um, but yeah, it's, I know what you're talking about. We just don't have a fair representation. Um, the, the model that we had in the, um, <clears throat> In this, it's it limits to how much we can model the uh, the adjacent parcel, right about. See, it, it starts to get over there, but that we we can actually revise the path, and that could show up a little bit better. No, we I can't manipulate this, and these models here were taken off of. Um, known elevations and uh, um, best estimations of rooftops from for like a two-story building from a given elevation. So this is as good as we have right now. We can um, provide different angle views, uh, but it is limited. <clears throat> Looking so. at this, well, <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> that that view. Um, just speaking to Commissioner Heising's concerns about the height. So because this, my understanding is because this, and we have sections, you know, you have several views that show this is because the site slopes, you're not actually seeing the five story height in most places. Can you point out if there are areas where if you're a person standing on, you know, whatever the available ground is that you're actually seeing a five story building? Yeah, it, this this area here, as far as the visibility of, of the project, um, crossing Mount Diablo Boulevard at this entrance is is where you'll see um, the the highest part. But you can see that we've intentionally dropped the ends of these buildings to three stories over the podium. So this this here is a, is a four story right here, and then it goes back to to what would be considered a five story, but half of the story is buried. So um, we, we've done our best to conceal the height with, with, with the commercial building blocking. I mean, if you were to drive along here, you're not even gonna see these until you get to the center. And that's a sort of a short view angle because the front buildings are gonna block the buildings behind. This is not a, unless you're a bird, you're not gonna see it this way. Mm -hmm. We've taken all this under consideration uh, particularly where we've dropped the ends of the buildings and provided the rooftop gardens and uh, one story less. So in, in, in for just that reason, what it might look like from an adjacent property, um, that would be, uh, I have to have something that's studied. Is this dropped area where the rooftop garden is, is that the same, um, is that idea this, the reason that the rooftop garden is on the west side of building one as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that, when we did the standard objectives um, and the, the requirement for each level to step back or step down in square footage from the ground level, the, the, this commercial building makes that criteria. And it was something that we were aware of in the design guidelines or the, the, the um, general plan or specific plan, as far as the stepping back of the ground level to the second to the third. Then the standards, I guess, were adopted last year, and and Nancy had brought it to our attention. Um, the the building along First Street is is so far back from the street. We're uh, hundred and something feet 
back from from there. So stepping this building back, um, I don't know if it was actually an intention. We thought it was an intention of a building fronting Mount Diablo or in this case, First Street. But, but our commercial building on Mount Diablo is really the only one that faces the street. The, the rest of these buildings, I don't know if these were intended to follow the same um, standard objectives of reducing the, the square footage. Maybe the city can go into that. I did read the objective standard several times and it seemed like they were talking about buildings fronting streets, not interior buildings. But that's something that's sort of a- well, Like the town center. Like, yeah, like town center. Yeah, we were, I mean, the impetus was to just get buildings to step. And, and we're, you know, we were trying to think of ways to, of um, guides to keep from having a block building. So I was just trying to figure out the way to talk about a step without, um, we, we, we landed on the area. Um, okay, yeah, I just asked about the roof decks because you mentioned when we were talking about building one, you mentioned views and I was wondering, I don't know what the views would be like at the, at the roof level, but I was, I was thinking about views to Mount Diablo and they don't seem necessarily positioned for that. So no. since you just mentioned the front no, buildings. Front two buildings are. Two and three. Yeah, two and th these two buildings are. Um, oh, excuse me. This, this is this is off of First Street, and this this mostly has views towards the Berkeley Hills. Okay. But um, the the two buildings fronting Mount Diablo have got will have incredible views of Mount Diablo, the mountain, and uh, because that from here is you know looking directly here, and even over the hills to Rossmore. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks for putting yeah, and the, and the together. garage really classifies as a basement, not not a story. I know that the city asked us to do the total height from the basement or from the uh, parking floor, but but as soon as you get up to this area, you're on the existing grade that you're on anyway. That's there now, so that's a four story building, not a five story building. Got it. Just okay. Clarification. Thank you. This was really helpful. Okay, um, I have a few questions. Does anyone else have questions? I'm scrolling through. I see Commissioner Mason. Thank you for clarifying because I looked at it the same way. It's four-story buildings with with a basement. Because and I won't go into all the whys. Uh, could you just clarify a little bit about the? Uh, we talked earlier about the handicap access to Lafayette Lane. Could you just touch briefly on how that would work with uh, internal security and key card access and gates and everything else that you probably have on this project? Uh, no, the, the, since Lafayette Lane is going to be a, a public access, there's going to be no restrictions to the these elevators here because it's all exterior. You don't have to go into the building at all. This um, there's one elevator here that's accessed from the outside. This is an outside elevator, so there's there's no restriction for anybody to come up here, use the elevator to get up to Lafayette Lane. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other hands? Oh, that's, that's, yeah, it's gotta be. Okay, um, I just have a few questions. I'll try to go through them quickly. Um, let's see, well, actually a lot of them have been answered. If, if, the, um, if the access to the Edmund Aqueduct Trail is worked out and it's determined that it would go there, where would the game room use go? You would have to look at that and, and, and uh, we were thinking of put it to, to one side or the other, um, but that's something that is yet to be discovered. At one time we had the, the, the game pavilion here, but in, in meetings they, and the city, uh, I think the city engineer was talking about getting this as a turnaround. So that's where the, the, the meet, uh, pick up and drop off is and we put the game pavilion back here. So that's something we'll have to look at. Maybe when we when we do that, we can incorporate the game pavilion and dig it into the hill on on one side, and then have the trail come off the other side or something like that. Okay. 
Um, is there, so the, I think Commissioner Cass mentioned some of the exterior materials. So it looks like there's a metal siding that resembles wood siding. And I was wondering the reasoning, one, the reasoning for using metal rather than just using wood, like, like what's on the library facade. Um, and then two, some of the renderings um, in the architectural set looked like that material was pretty light and sort of really popped out. But then the last sheet showed a color that more resembled the color of the stained wood at the library. So I was wondering what the color is and then the reason for the material. There, there's several different colors. The reason that it's metal is for, for longevity um, and for uh, sustainability. Um, metal, the metal is something that doesn't obviously cut down forests. Um, so these, the, the products that were selected um, are very, very durable and environmentally friendly. Uh, the, the color of the woods can be, there's, I think when I were looking at them, about a half dozen really nice colors for the, the, the metal wood siding. And uh, once it's up there, it's, it's that way forever. Uh, no restaining or refinishing or warping or anything like that. It's, it's okay. done. Yeah, I noticed the library, they have to stain it pretty frequently. And it looks bad yeah, yeah. before you it's do it, unless you do it at a quick interval. No, it's a maintenance thing. And then, as you know, with condominiums and whatnot, um, liability is, is a huge consideration. So when you, when you get finished with these things, they're pretty much bulletproof. Otherwise, uh, nine years, 11 months, and 29 days, you're going to have a knock on the door from an attorney. So, so you said right now you're proposing to use that material in different colors in different places? Right. Yes. Okay. Would you, I don't know, personally, we'll probably talk about this more during the, the later part of the meeting, but um, would you be open to using like a darker color in that upper level? Oh, oh, definitely. There was some recommendations from city staff about some of the comments of the, uh, some of the banding along here and uh, some of the, the materials and, and the, the use of the corrugated metal as a, as a walling, a, a wall finish as opposed to a trim. So yeah, those are all something that we're considering uh, in far as uh, aesthetics. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's very consistent to what's there now. There's these uh, high-pitched metal roofs currently there, mm -hmm. um, standing seam roofs, and the library's got the standing seam roof. So it's kind of a kind of an homage to what's currently there and what's across the street. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay, then I had some questions about landscape. Um, so I'm looking at the plans. I, I'm still not completely clear as to where where there will be usable green space. I mean, right now the landscape plan is mostly just showing trees, and then the views it's you know showing sort of like what looks like a lawn type area. There was one view I think down with First Street at your back, and it looks like um, there's these really wide lawn areas, but the proportion of the width of the the fire access. Um, lane way to the green space on either side seemed off compared to the plan. Um, so it might be a question for the landscape architect, but I'm just wondering, I, I mean, I saw, I know there's the, the courtyard with the DG for building five and then the game house looked like it had an exterior area, but I'm just wondering where else people can sort of play and sit and do lawn type activities. Oh. Yeah, um, up, up so along, who has control of the screen? I do. You want to? You want to take it? Um, no, you can because you know the the um, sheets. But do you want to go to the enlargement of the between building three and four? So along. Because we're working out the, I think the front elevations of the area and all of the different fly-throughs and the 
the building, I don't know, um, the building views, they, you, you'll probably notice that they varied a little bit from the different sketch or the different 3D models. Um, but what's being worked out there is um, playing with the different amount of green space in um, off of the fire truck lane. Um, so there will be usable space in that green space there. It has that hatch pattern, but we'll play with that size. And down here, this, um, that's not a picture of it, but in the fly through, there was a 3D model where there was furniture and there will be a gathering space there. That's a pedestrian level space. And then movable chairs, or Adirondack chairs, kind of, you know, lounge stuff that would be park, a park-like setting in this area. And okay. then- um, so the, Can I pause you for a second? So sure. the little insets, are those the patios that are at the same level? That is right, Mike? Yes. Yes. The, okay. These are the, the patios on the street. On the street. All, all of these are the private patios along the street. And then these are the, the, the buffer area that Angela was talking about. We can, we can change this around a little bit to introduce what Nancy was saying about maybe little alcoves and seating areas. Yeah, I was wondering, well, because everything's linear as it's shown right now, I was thinking having, you know, your sort of park like benches along a path may not, it may be okay or it may not be the best option. Like normally we like to see, you know, sort of a, like a gathering space with, with benches. And I was wondering how you would sort of carve out areas for that. Well, what we were talking about is that there was a study years ago about how people like to move their furniture a little bit. And so if we have a section where there's movable chairs and people can come over and pull up chairs or bring a little blanket out on the lawn or ground cover, or turf, whatever, we end up using that space. Um, something where there's choices of how you configure that area. That was kind of more of like a passive, passive area where it's not designated. Whereas at the end of this lane where we'd have furniture under this kind of overlook, that would be more of like a formal group setting. And then if we move along to the, are you asking just for the open green space? Well, I, so I started, when I was looking at it, I was trying to figure, I was trying to sort of um, match what I was seeing in plan view with some of the images, which sort of seemed to show these wider lawn areas with people playing football. So then I was looking at the I think that and, might have been up, was that at the commons and that might've been at different stages of a different design stages when we had the play area over at the other side. Um, like I had mentioned, we had tried to um, introduce a lot of turf stone that might've been the green area that you're talking about, but the fire district just wouldn't um, uh, have okay. it. Okay. Yeah. There, I mean, I think at one point this, this area here was when maybe- That was all green. Oh, yeah. this, I see. So I'm looking at- turf stone, which was represented as green. This yes. sheet, like sheet A2.3. Um, well, wait, that's, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is in between, that's building mm -hmm. two there, and this was all that, that the turf stone, okay, okay, this is the yeah. bank, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, um, but we do have a larger green space at the building, um, that has the unique courtyard mm -hmm. on the left, so we're, determining whether or not that's going to be a lawn or a turf and, um, or, you know, kind of like a decomposed granite thing, but I think lawn would be more usable overall where they'd have the hanging chairs and the trees. And it's kind of like a very passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw the image of that. I guess that seems like such a nice amenity for the building. Um, I was wondering if it was possible to carve out a similar space for, for it doesn't have to necessarily be for each building, but at each building so that it's easily accessible. And then, well, I have a couple other comments just or questions on sort of piggybacking here. The, uh, the common building with the outdoor kitchen, 
the, I mean, there's one outdoor kitchen that was looking at, you know, the number of units and the number of potential residents. And I was wondering if you, you know, is that enough to serve the whole development? And if you um, started to carve out sort of these ga outdoor gathering type spaces for each building, would it make sense? Well, each to... building does have the roof deck and there will be a couple of girls, like large enough counters to accommodate you know, a couple of different parties on each roof deck as well. Okay, okay. Um, and we can add more counter space and another grill and overhead, you know, we can do whatever. Okay, yeah, and, and, and all the roof areas are for the entire building, mm -hmm. it's open access. Yes. Bye. Okay. Okay, I think that's all my questions, thank you. Okay, um, so at this time we will open public comment. First speaker is gonna be Daniel Hoag, followed by Lisa Kleinbub. Daniel Hoag, I'm letting him into the meeting now. Hi, can you see me? Yes, and we can hear you. Great. Um, hello, Design Review Commissioners uh, and uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, my name is Dan Hogue. I'm the Executive Director here at Los Trampas, uh, which is located at 3460 Lana Lane in Lafayette. Uh, we've been in the community since 1958. Um, and as a service provider uh, of services for people with the intellectual and developmental disabilities, also known as IDD, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, so the corporate terrace project proposes to set aside 44 units for very low income persons with uh, IDD. And we at Las Trompas applaud the efforts of any developer to ensure community inclusion for people with IDD. Uh, as we know, most people with IDD face economic challenges, including obtaining gainful employment, and most are relegated to financial assistance programs, including subsidized housing to ensure their ability to live in their communities. Um, but as stated, we appreciate the effort that is proposed here. However, I want to be sure that you, the commissioners and the public are fully aware of what community inclusion means and the ability to live amongst and interact with peers without similar dis disabling conditions. The, propor the proposed 44 units housed in the, a building separate from their neighbors who do not have similar, similar disabilities is not, in full, is not full inclusion. Integration, yes. Inclusion, no. And I have a video that I can share that shows the difference. The IDD community led by self-advocates has long been working to move away from environments where people with IDD are congregated or se segregated from others. I understand that there will be opportunities for this community to attend neighbor events so that they can interact. It sounds like Sunflower Hill will be operating in the building. However, I remain concerned that without them ensuring that these events take place and that other people other than those with IDD actually attend, this segregated building only becomes another congregate setting, not, fully, uh, not fulfilling its intent on community inclusion. I also wanna note that when walking into a residential housing unit, no one should get the feeling that this is for a particular segment of that population. That includes economic, social, or disability populations. In the Wendell Rosen letter, and we love Wendell Rosen and all of their advocacy for IDD, uh, that letter that was included in the project description indicates that this type of setting is the best way to provide supports for people with IDD. As a supported and independent living provider, we at Las Trumpets can assure that supports can and should be provided in a person-centered way regardless of the setting. In other words, we work with individuals in their own apartments and homes and 100% of them live in communities where they have direct neighbors who do not have IDD. We do this with any, in any residential development, whether it's a one person amongst 10 units or a few in a very large complex. And in this model, individuals with IDD have the opportunities to build natural supports as they build relationships with their neighbors, just like we do. As advocates for the people that we serve, we at Las Trampas strongly believe that the project should have these units interspersed throughout all buildings, 
so that residents with IDD can build relationships and friendships within their community and be seen as true equals. If we want communities to accept people with IDD as equals, they need to have the opportunity to directly interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Placing them in a separate building diminishes that. From my understanding of the project description, it was stated that the developer is working closely with Regional Center of the East Bay, East Bay or RCB. However, in emails that I've had with key management at RCB, they indicated that they were unaware of this project. And Lisa Kleinbub is the executive director who will be speaking next. So again, I want to ensure that we appreciate the sentiment of the developer to provide affordable, accessible housing for those with IDD as it's very much needed. I just want to ensure that the appropriate voices are at the table so that we can ensure that there is no appearance of segregation and that people with IDD are truly seen as equals within their community. I'm sure RCEB, IDD service providers, and most importantly, people with IDD would love the opportunity to discuss this project further and provide the developer with their insights. After all, we can't forget that people with IDD have, vo have a voice and their desires should be heard. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair Farzan has a, his oh. hand raised. Commissioner Farzan. Mr. Hogue, it, it, fair enough to say, based on your presentation, you haven't spoken to the developer about this project? I have not. Um, you know, actually, uh, we had contracted with uh, Ward Young at one time and so forth and had talked about independent and supported living models uh, at that time, but that was like six years ago. So, but this particular project, we have not actually had any contact, so. Thank you. Commissioner LeBange. Um, Mr. Hogue, would it, uh, I'm trying to understand, because again, this is not a topic I'm not familiar with. Could someone with I, IDD, do, do they need extra services that, you know, would not, would, would be in, in the applicant's, you know, vision would be provided in a, in a building versus in an integrated building that would be integrated, but everybody's really on their own. They're just all in one building together. So the way supported living services or independent living services are really designed is to look at a person-centered approach and determine what their specific needs are and to build those supports around them in their environment. So what we do is we, uh, do assessments and so forth and figure out what supports do they need? Do they require 24 seven one-on-one supports with somebody and we can provide that? Or do they just require a few hours every day or a few hours every week? So that's determined between the interdisciplinary team, the individual, and of course the individual is the, the primary person, the, the number one person that we need to hear from. What do they want? What do they need? What's good for them and what's, what's important to them and what's important for them? And we balance all that together, build a plan and build a uh, support plan for that individual. So yes, we can do that in any location. As I said, we currently support 23 individuals in our supported living program. Each of them has an apartment of their own all throughout uh, Central and East Contra Costa County, as well as uh, 17 individuals in independent living. So, so let me follow on and, and I don't think this is very dissimilar than letting the market decide. So what I think I hear you saying is you help people in, in their needs. Could, could, could you also say then, well, people who would select this type of product see the need that it provides is what they're looking for. It's not like if this is a product, people of IDD are going to be forced to go into it. They, they and their families will choose this is the product that works for them. And if, and if it doesn't, I mean, I'm not trying to advocate for it. I'm just really trying to break down your discussion versus you know, well, there's, a, there's a lot involved here, you know, especially when you're looking at funding from uh, the regional center of the East Bay or also looking at uh, funding from the federal government. Uh, health, uh, home and community based uh, service waivers require, they require inclusion. 
not integration, not segregation. They require inclusion in order to be funded. And there, there's, a, there's now new requirements that are requiring a breakaway from congregate settings. I also have another concern in the fact that if we have 44 individuals living in one huge building and a service provider on site, do we run into community care licensing regulations where the entire building, building has to be licensed by community care, license, community care licensing as a residential facility? Um, and so those are things that you'll need to keep in mind as you move forward. Um, we do operate adult residential facilities. However, each of those are four bed facilities with no neighboring uh, IDD um, homes. So they're in communities, the, each of their neighbors um, are people without disabilities. You would drive past that home and you would never even know that it was a home for people with it, it, uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities. The, um, and it's intended to be that way. Did that, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. The, the one thing that caught my ear the most was the funding part, because I want to make sure I don't understand how the funding works for them. Did, did they say anything that made you think the funding that they were going to use or the whatever structures were going to help with the separate parcel would, would be relying on the fact that they're inclusionary and thus... Your you point. know, um, in, in actuality, I think uh, your next speaker, Lisa Kleinbub, who's the executive director of Regional Center of the East Bay, would better be able to address that. I do know that as a provider of independent and supported living services that our funding would be, and also adult residential facilities, is that if we did not meet the HCBS waiver requirements for inclusion, that our funding would be um, in jeopardy. It would come under what we call a, a high scrutiny by the federal government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa Kleinbub is coming in followed by Tim Hennessy and then I'll thank Daniel for his uh, comments. You can, you can excuse me now. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Hi there, um, Lisa Kleinbub. I'm the executive director of the Regional Center of the East Bay, and I'm really happy to hear that this project is considering um, including below market rent units and specifically for people with developmental disabilities. We as the Regional Center of the East Bay serve um, people with developmental disabilities in both Alameda and Contra Costa County. We have over 23,000 people that we serve in our counties. And um, we are pleased that people may have an opportunity for affordable housing. However, the supports that we provide are all provided on an individual basis. So each individual that we serve has their own plan. They are not served because they live in an apartment next door to another person with a developmental disability by the same service provider. They get to choose the provider that they want. And I really do believe that um, for all, all reasons, including our funding, I don't believe the tax credits are only limited to a single building. And I'd encourage the developer to talk to some other affordable housing providers who work very closely with people with developmental disabilities to look at the tax credits and how those can be applied in an inclusionary manner. Um, many people that are served by the regional center would not want to live in a building that is only for people with developmental disabilities. One of the most attractive things about this complex would be how close it is to BART and how that would afford people who go out to work every day to be able to go to work and come back home independently. So a lot of the things that were in the materials um, that you had describing the population that would live here are probably not considering the range of people 
who we support with developmental disabilities who really need affordable housing. So I look forward if the developer wants to speak with me, my staff, um, and some of our partners that we've worked on other housing projects with, um, we, could, we could talk about this. I also do work very closely with Sunflower Hill that's been involved with another development but each of the individuals served there may have the support of Sunflower Hill as a management company in the building they live in, but they also have their own individualized supports that are developed through their ID team. So it doesn't have to be a set aside building. It could be inclusive units in the whole complex. And that may also afford for some different ways of thinking about the um, complex with maybe single um, one bedroom units interspersed as well. So um, that's all I wanna share with you, but I'm happy to talk to anyone else further. Thank you. Looks like we might have a question for you. Commissioner Mason. Uh, just to confirm, um, there was a comment earlier that for the IDD, there's a strong preference for one bedrooms. Is that your experience? also, regardless of whether they're congregated or separated? Yeah, um, you know, that's that's not true. Some people really want to live with um, a friend or they have a live-in person who provides support. So there is a way that if you have affordable units, Section 8 units, those sort of um, units, you can have a caregiver live in the same apartment as you. They have their own bedroom. So for people especially who have a lot of care needs, having a two bedroom apartment is really um, desirable. We also have many individuals with developmental disabilities who are children and parts of families who may want to live in a unit with a couple and a child. We, have, um, we also have um, consumers who have family members um, and have children. So it, I can't predict one or the other in terms of that. Thank you, Ms. Kleinbaum. Thank you. Bringing in Tim Hennessy and following Tim will be Larry Hayden. Greg, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Tim Hennessy. I am a Lafayette resident. I uh, live at 521 Silverado Way in Burton Valley. Um, I am one of the founding uh, board members of the Park Theater Trust. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of the board uh, of the Park Theater Trust in support of this project. Um, just a little quick background on the Park Theater Trust. Uh, it was born out of a task force that was a city mandated task force three years ago. Uh, and it was formed specifically with the intent to try to figure out what to do with the park theater uh, building in the middle of town that's been vacant for going on 15 years. Um, you know, today, three years later, um, the Park Theater Trust is a duly formed 501c3 nonprofit. It consists of six board members and uh, luckily for us, we have dozens of community, um, <clears throat> local citizens in the community serving on committees and sub subcommittees supporting the board. Um, from the very beginning, uh, our mission statement was very simple. Um, we wanted to fulfill the wishes of the Lafayette community to acquire and restore the park theater to create a multi-purpose, multi-generational venue to be enjoyed by all members of the community. Um, we are very grateful to uh, have had the opportunity over the last year and a half to work with Perry and his team um, on securing a $2 million seed donation. Uh, these funds will go a long way uh, towards the acquisition of the property. <clears throat> this uh, $2 million seed donation um, it will help us repurpose what many in the community uh, consider to be the most iconic, uh, most architecturally significant building in all of Lafayette, not to mention its location in town, which is largely bookends uh, the one, one section of town. Um, as it relates to Lafayette Lane, um, the Park Theater Board, uh, like I said, is in support of the current plan. 
a few a few benefits that I would like to uh, bring forth and, and you know make note of. First is um, especially given the current pandemic and the uh, the failing level of retail uh, you know retailers and shops in town or in La in Lombard in general. Um, you know we think this could be a real shot in the arm for local retailers and um, restaurants. You could have three hundred or so people uh, at this uh, project once it's built. Um, kind of walking and shopping and eating uh, downtown. We think that would be very beneficial. Um, secondly, uh, the project is mixed use in nature uh, and it's in a transit friendly uh, location. Um, and, and honestly, uh, you know, you're replacing a lot of what we consider to be obsolete office space at this time um, and replacing it with, you know, newer state of the art um, uh, space along uh, Mount Diablo. Uh, those, are, those are the couple of benefits we'd like to mention and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hennessy. And to the commission, I won't ask if there's questions for the speaker, just raise your hand if there's something you wanna ask. Bringing in Larry Hayden, followed by um, an attendee identified as Sunflower Hill. There we go. Am I on? Yes, you are. Audio. Okay. Uh, good evening. Um, first off, I'd like to thank all of you for your dedication and service to the Lafayette community and all the residents here in the city. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Larry Hayden. I'm a lifelong resident of Lafayette. Um, and um, my entire career has been involved in managing and investing in commercial, residential, industrial um, investment properties um, and doing development and redevelopment work. Um, I'm on the board of directors of the Park Theater Trust. And um, I've got to tell you, when I, when I first heard about the Miramar project, I was very concerned um, because I, I viewed the office space in corporate terrace is being very valuable to the community for for business needs and everything um and I, i'll tell you the, my perspective on this was my company was the original anchor tenant of that complex when it was built in 1982 we occupied 20 percent of that complex so my vision of the complex is very state-of-the-art um you know beautiful place to have an office and um and uh, I, you know, I hadn't been down there for years, um, but, um, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fathom tearing it down. So I, I decided I had to come to grips with this and I went down and walked around. And I was shocked with what I found. Um, the deferred maintenance is huge. Uh, the building is just plain obsolete. Um, it, it has nothing to do with today's requirements for businesses. Um, I could see where trying to, there were the, there was substantial vacancy. I couldn't tell how much I was guessing, you know, 40 or 50% vacancy. I guess um, Perry said tonight it's, it's 30, 30% vacant, something like that. But I can see where it's a huge challenge to reoccupy that building. Um, and economically to renovate it, to bring it up to today's standards, I think would just be a ridiculous economic task with and um, to bring it up to something that, that would be feasible for today. So to go from from my original thought to today, I mean, if I see if this building stays there, it's going to be a white elephant in Lafayette for years to come. So to replace it with uh, this complex with housing that with, with 30,000 feet of brand new state of the art office space, which will serve the community very well, I think is it's an outstanding reuse of the prop of the property. Um, and I, I'm very impressed that they they figured out how to put this together and and that mixed use way and provide the office space and and the housing using the housing to to um, you know help economically pay for it. So I just I'm I'm very much in favor of the project after starting out very negative on it. <laughs> um, 
And then when I when I joined the board, uh, Mr. Of, Mr. Hayden, your your time just went. If you could, okay, I'm done. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank you. for your comments. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Sunflower Hill, followed by Iman Novin. Hi, um, are you able to hear me? We yes. are. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Edie Nels, and I'm the executive director of Sunflower Hill. And it's very nice to be with you all here this evening. And I'd like to take a moment to thank you so much for um, considering this project and considering um, Sunflower Hill's participation in it. Um, discussing affordable housing for adults with developmental disabilities is obviously critical to our organization. As um, you heard from Rosemary Kerbach, she and a number of other parents from this area of the um, East Bay are um, parents of loved ones with developmental disabilities and their gravest concern is what will happen to their loved one when they are no longer able to care for them in a family or caregiver home. Um, we are thrilled to have just leased up Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch and as you heard we have had over 300 people um, interested in living at Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch. Independent living in their own um, apartments, one and two bedroom apartments with services provided by the Regional Center of the East Bay. Um, to Commissioner LeBong's point, what was very interesting to me is that we actually had a number of residents choose to move from um, a typical apartment complex, I guess you would say, where they were uh, affordable apartments interspersed with market rate apartments to Irby Ranch, um, with some of the comments being that they felt isolated living there. Um, it's a very individual choice, um, but we are um, an organization that has a lot of people who are very interested in living in um, an apartment community that has similar um, amenities to senior living. So programs provided on site to um, have residents involved not only in the community and inviting the greater community in, but residents going out in coordinated activities um, with their peers and uh, colleagues who are uh, neurotypical as well as develop developmentally disabled. And as Lisa Kleinbub mentioned, we are thrilled to have partnered with them on the lease up of this community to ensure that the residents would be able to have services provided um, to them, both ILS and SLS. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? Is that appropriate right now? Um. Sure. After each speaker speaks, if anyone, has, if any of the commissioners have questions, we'll we can ask it now. Um, any questions for the speaker? I guess I had one question. I'm not really sure how to ask it, but um, when you're talking about the population that you serve, do you see? And I don't even know if this so much matters with with the um, the funding questions that, that the director of Los Trombas brought up, but. Um, I was trying to bring together your feedback and Ms. Kerbach's feedback with the other feedback we've gotten, which are um, a bit contradictory. And I was wondering if you see needs differ by age group within the population that you're serving. Like, or, or was Ms. Kerbach mainly thinking about young adults, whereas like Los Trombas is looking at a bigger age range or? Actually, we're looking at the bigger age range as well. Okay. And it's, okay. it's, so different depending on each individual. Um, definitely imagine that people will, and at our Irby Ranch um, community, people have moved in who are um, over the age of 22, just over the age of 22, but then we also have people who are in their 50s and 60s and families um, where the parents are developmentally disabled. Um, and families where the parents are typical and the children have developmental disabilities. So it's quite a range. Um, and that's one of the interesting and unique parts of it. 
so you're describing the age range at that specific development. Could that be a reason why, I guess, why there's personal preference for truly inclusive layout so that younger, like for example, younger individuals might wanna be in a building where there's other individuals their age, not in a building where there's only people with developmental. And I, and I, I think that that, yeah, that is, it's personal preference. And I think that, you know, like any residential community, there's a model for all of us. And I think some people see Sunflower Hill and this sort of community as a model for themselves. Um, and, and, and I think other people might not think that um, as well. And it also depends on the level of need. There are some people that um, this wouldn't, wouldn't be the right fit for. And you're supportive of the number of one bedrooms versus the number of two bedrooms proposed? Yeah, yes. Um, we, so we have 22 one bedrooms um, at Sunflower Hill at Irby Ranch and eight two bedroom apartments. One of those two bedroom apartments is for a uh, property um, on site maintenance manager to live. Um, the two bedroom apartments, it's really interesting. We thought we would have a lot of people interested in having a roommate and apply as roommates, as households. And we only had one um, group come together to apply as a roommate household group. Um, three of the apartments are the families that I discussed, the two bedroom apartments. And then the other three are, um, sorry, the other four are apartments where somebody has a live-in aid or caregiver or have requested a reasonable accommodation um, to have a two-bedroom apartment. So I, I, I feel like the, based on the knowledge that we have that that unit mix is um, in keeping with what worked well for us at Irby Ranch. Okay. And, and you don't match people with, help match people with roommates. It's people, come, individuals coming in together already wanting that. Correct. Yep. They come together um, because that's such a personal thing as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for your comments yeah, and answering thank questions. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Um, so the last person with a raised hand um, is Iman Novin, and he's now invited to go ahead and speak. Good evening, Commission. Thank you uh, <clears throat> for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Iman Novin. I am an affordable housing development expert and uh, glad to be working on the team um, here. I wanted to clarify some questions that came up earlier about uh, uh, tax credits, um, as well as uh, the need to have this building uh, be um, uh, design the way it is to serve this population. Um, there, <clears throat> I will start by saying that <clears throat> it's not an either or. Um, I think we need housing um, that serves a broad spectrum um, and is designed in a variety of ways. Um, building housing with tax credit affordable uh, financing has its advantages in that um, it does allow you to serve a deeper population with a larger building, more units, um, and it allows for long-term maintenance and operational revenue to ensure that the model is sustainable long-term. I think you heard some comments earlier about from a, from a service provider's perspective of being able to serve individuals that live in different areas. And that's absolutely important and critical. I think what we're talking about here is independent living for individuals with dis uh, developmental disabilities, um, akin to senior housing. Um, uh, individuals with dis uh, developmental disabilities, like seniors, are a protected class in the fair housing laws. Um, and the Tax Credit Allocation Committee allows housing to be built to serve special needs populations, just like we build affordable housing to serve teachers, just like we build affordable housing to serve veterans, um, you know, we can be, uh, we can target um, tax credits towards uh, various housing types. Large families, seniors, again, are examples. Um, this is a successful model um, that has happened across the state and Sunflower Hill happens to be sort of the trailblazer. Um, last year, their um, project was the highest 
scoring 9% special needs project in the state. Um, and um, they've worked very hard to sort of get a lot of the tax credit rules um, clarified to work for this population. So um, I, I wanna emphasize how, uh, that a, a, a important factor why the affordable housing is in one building is tax credits. It is because the state requires that there be deed restriction for 55 years and we need to be able to parcelize and create a separate legal parcel, separate legal condo to record those deed restrictions on um, for at least 55 years. Um, uh, and so a, a lot of the, the reason that affordable housing or tax credit housing in general across the country is designed this way is because of the tax credit system that we have does want to see individual buildings that, that you can guarantee will stay affordable uh, for at least 55 years. Also because of the provision of pr uh, programs um, tailored to the residents. Sunflower Hill has worked successfully with the regional center of the East Bay to design programs specific to the residents at their Irby Ranch project, which allows them to create a for special needs individuals. Um, and this is all codified in state law. Um, so happy to answer any uh, specific questions about that. Thank you. And your timer just went, but I think we do have a question for you. Uh, Commissioner Farsan. Hi, Iman. Uh, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, so as I understand tax credits um, for affordable housing, you can still have the deed restrictions for a unit. You don't have to have it for a building, right? So, correct? Uh, not exactly, because a tax credit investor is not going to um, invest in a single unit uh, building. Um, what you're talking about perhaps is if you did like what's called Swiss cheese, where you did a, a, a condo map that is air condos of multiple parcels across, you know, a lot of different spaces in a building. And, and to be honest, that is basically never done just because it's so complicated and tax credit investors run away from that. Um, it, it's a very complicated condo map to make that feasible and, and oftentimes not something that cities or jurisdictions or tax credit investors will need. So, you know, you can get units um, uh, interspersed, but that's typically called below market rate housing, where a market rate developer is just in units at 80% AMI, um, usually for like a moderate income household. That's not creating what we call tax credit affordable, which is usually serving extremely low income, you know, 30, 20, 30% AMI, um, that really does require a separate building with tax credit subsidy to pay over $30 million for the cost of this building, um, as well as operating subsidy from um, project-based vouchers and other sources. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Thank you. Uh, so Tom Chastain had his hand raised, but it appears to have gone down. I'll invite it's now back up. So Mr. Chastain is the is the last speaker uh, who has raised their hands. And then after public comment, I'll suggest uh, a brief five minute recess before moving into deliberations. Hello, and thank you for your work. We Hello. can see you and hear you. Hi, Tom. I wasn't going to say anything, but then I thought I should. As uh, someone who's involved with the inclusionary housing ordinance, um, I think the principle is really simple and very good. We don't want to segregate people. Um, equity is about living together. So I think that principle is really sound and, and ought to be amplified and understood uh, as you work through the problems ahead of you. Um, I'm also someone who is working with this community. So I have my own experiences and my own uh, desires to see that they're, uh, that they're advanced. And I think if we have an opportunity to build housing for them, that's pretty good. We shouldn't just uh, think otherwise. I mean, this is a great opportunity, but it's also an opportunity that we ought to get right so I've listened to this thing this evening, and I think my advice to the commissions would be to, 
to direct staff to try to get all of these stakeholders together a little bit. I mean, uh, this is not the first time we're gonna have to deal with this. This is a great problem, a great problem to figure out right. So I, I think uh, it would be great to get the whole uh, community of stakeholders together to really talk about uh, what this proposal is, what's wrong with it, what's good with it, what do you wanna do with it? Uh, and, and that would be not just the developers team, but a whole group. It might generate a whole other kind of set of understandings that the community could use to direct other projects. So uh, I think that's kind of what you guys should do is to reach out and get all these people to talk a bit more together to figure out how you, how you should think about this project. And I think it also ought to include more understanding about how to afford it. Um, uh, it. Like I said, I think it's great that we have this opportunity. So if the only way to afford it is one building, you should pay attention, but maybe there's other ways and that should be made apparent to the commissions. So that, that's my only thought after hearing tonight. Um, this is a great project, uh, great opportunity, uh, worthy community. And uh, I think it just ought to ask staff to kind of do a bit more homework for all of you so it can really be understood better. And that's all. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate it. Sure. Good night. Night. We have one more public speaker. I'm bringing in Cheryl McDonald. And, and I'll ask anyone else wishing to speak under public comments to raise their hand now so we can manage the time for the evening. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead, Ms. McDonald. Sorry, I unmuted. Um, I really appreciate what Tom Chastain just said. And then I also wanted to um, acknowledge that I really appreciate that the commercial space increased. Um, I had a question, I haven't studied everything completely, but I did have a question about the five story and how much parking is underground and if we could lower the floor any way, the five stories down to four stories, including the parking and have another layer underground. I'm concerned about the five stories. Is there any way to bring five stories down to four stories? If we can't reduce units, can we somehow put more parking underground in, in any way? And those are my questions, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so that was our last public speaker? Correct. Okay, um, so we will take a five minute break. It's 9.52, we'll take a five minute break now. And then when we come back, uh, the applicant has an opportunity to respond to some of the speakers and then we'll move on to commission, commissioner deliberation. Thank you.
Hey, Greg. Yes. Are we going to have a separate resolution out of design review from planning, or how is this going to be accomplished the rest of this meeting? Um, there there's no need for a formal action and um, a, a written resolution to forward to planning commission um, as the, the two commissions are meeting together jointly. So the planning commission, the ERC is able to provide direct input and comments to the, to the planning commission. So we wouldn't uh, do a separate resolution. Okay. We're just waiting on two commissioners, one commissioner. Okay. Uh, reconvening and now we'll go back to the applicant and you have uh, five minutes, I believe, for rebuttal or response to the public comments or anything else. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like the comments that we heard tonight um, and it, it seems that we knew that there was going to be some um, uh, requirements to explain the housing. Um, Am I? I'm sorry, I got something up on my screen. Um, so the, the the concept of having our uh, the special needs, we we can't uh, we can't see you. I don't know if you think your video. Oh. No, I didn't turn it off. I think uh, Greg may have turned it off. Greg, Greg, get it. Oh, here I can start it again. I guess. <laughs> sorry. Okay. You're welcome to blame me. <laughs> I, I know. I don't remember touching that. I might have scrolled over it. So I just noticed it was off when I looked up and it was off. Um, so the, the, the difference with our project is, yes, the, the, you can have individuals dispersed throughout the community in, in different houses you don't know as you drive down the street. The difference is, is that's, that's a choice to do that. It's not a requirement to um, provide housing. So in our pro, um, project, with the state mandates and the requirements of providing affordable housing, this is our mechanism we've chosen in order to make it actually viable and pay for it and restrict it for 50 years. So I think what um, some of the speakers said make perfect sense. Now, I do understand what Tom Chastain was saying about looking into this more and discussing it more, but... Um, Hey, Mike, can I chime in real quick? Um, hey, this, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. Just real quick, we do uh, agree with Tom's point that uh, we will get the stakeholders together and try to come up with some solutions. There's no one pr perfect way to do this. There are, um, we're going to put the, the groups together and come up with some solutions. But there's one important distinction that Amon talked about that is very important here. Um, if we were to do inclusionary housing per the ordinance, these would be 15% of the units and they would be for sale units that serve people that make 80% AMI. This that will not serve this population. That's very important to know. This population is very, very low income. They cannot qualify to buy uh, these condos, even affordable condos at 80% AMI. They won't, uh, I don't think, any lender would uh, loan to them. This is the only way to serve this population is to have this, um, this type of financing and this type of project. They cannot afford to buy condominiums, even affordable condominiums in this project. It would be a completely different uh, population that it would serve. So uh, we will definitely get together with the stakeholders, but it's important to realize they're two different things. We could either do 15% for sale inclusionary housing, which will serve a totally different population, or we could do this, but you can't do inclusionary that serves adults with, you can't finance a project with inclusionary um, 
housing for adults with developmental disabilities. So it's, it's kind of an important distinction there. Um, but I'll let Mike talk about some of the design project design. Yeah, thank you. And then, and then uh, the other thing that came up was again about the five story and, and really, you know, with, with a podium and the underground parking, um, there are two, two buildings fully outright that are, are four stories and only the first part of buildings two and three uh, w could even be considered uh, five stories because as soon as you go up the hill, it's, it becomes a basement. So there are other five story buildings in Lafayette. One is at the town center uh, right behind the um, commercial space there. It's, it's pure five story ground up and not even on a podium. So it's not unusual to have it. Um, we, we explain in the, the waivers, the reasons that we need it. And I understand the people's concern about the scale, but this is, this is what we're presenting tonight. Yeah, so, um, and, that, and that's really about it. There was those items about, um, mostly about the inclusionary housing. So. Okay. Um, I actually had a question about the inclusionary housing. And, and this is, as I'm in a similar shoes as Commissioner Labonjo. This is relatively new to me as well. Um, using the, the tools that you're proposing on this project with the separate building, is there an ability to use those same tools and like split the units in half and put half in another, you know, have, have a building that's half of those units and half your typical units? It has to be on one piece of property. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But you can't define two two parcels in the same way, or it's only those type of units on the parcel. I mean, you can have two buildings on the same parcel. Um, I think part of it also just gets to like building efficiencies. Like you wouldn't take a 40 unit building and turn it into 22 units. Um, you know that increases the skin of the buildings, it increases the cost of elevators. This is probably elevator served buildings, so now you need two elevators. And so for the efficiency of using that public subsidy of tax credits, we try to design the building as efficiently as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. Um, Let's just sort of go down the line or around the screen. And um, if people could you know, share their comments in an organized fashion, um, I mean, we could probably, we could do architect any architectural comments and landscape comments. And if you could also voice your support or, um, um, or revisions or lack of support for for the recommendations that staff put forth in the staff report that would be helpful as well so we will start with the vice chair farsan i wasn't expecting that um so <laughs> i'll go so let me uh, let me first of all give uh credit to um the applicant and and the team for listening um to our last meeting um, I appreciate what they did with the parking because that was an, uh, an issue. I appreciate they, they listened to us on having additional commercial space. Although I will note this, even if the current property is 72% occupied, 72% of the 81,000 gets you to about 58,000 square feet. Now we're going to be down to 29,000 square feet. So that means at least 50% of those uh, that's in use now is going to be gone. Um, so no matter how damp, moist, whatever that property definition is old, there's still 58,000 square feet of commercial that's being leased right now. So I do appreciate that. Um, but I want to voice that because, again, we don't want to lose our retail and our commercial space like we are now. Um, I, I always defer on design, et cetera, to the experts. So I always keep it to myself unless there's something that really jumps out at me. The only thing I will add is what almost everyone has said. I wish it wasn't as tall as it is. But at least from the renderings that we saw on some of the 3D, I don't think it's going to be as massive as I imagined it to be. 
um, thinking about it. But again, a concern, but I don't think there's going to be much that we can do about that unless, as I believe Ms. McDonald says, you can build more parking downward. But again, not my expertise, so I'm not going to go there. Um, the final thing I will say is what I brought up during the last meeting and obviously what's been the focus of my meeting here. If there is a way we can disperse these units, the affordable units through the property, that would be my biggest thing that I would push for. I'm actually not my expertise, but I deal with finance enough. I'm happy to look at TCAC and everything else before our next meeting and join the people to try to see if there's a way that this can be done. I will obviously defer to the experts, Iman and others on this, but I just cannot imagine that that financing through public tax credits cannot work except for putting people into a single building. I, again, it might be true, but I have a hard time believing that. So that's where I'll leave it. Again, I like, uh, I like what the team did here. I, I think it's getting closer to, to what I think the group is looking for, but the inclusionary housing, which I really, really want, and I appreciate the numbers, um, just wish it wasn't in a building, one building. Thank you, Commissioner Varsan. Um, Commissioner Heisen. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I'm supportive of the project. I think it's a, a good project. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier in, in the discussion, I'm not a big fan of the height, um, but I, I understand the bonus density law and how it works and how um, we don't have much control over that. Um, I fully support staff's recommendation, especially the connection of uh, to the East Bay mud path. I, I really, of, of all the staff's recommendations, that's the one that sticks out to me that I feel is important just from a walkability, um, pedestrian oriented project. That would be a, it would be a missed opportunity if we couldn't make a connection to that trail um, without uh, people having to walk out on First Street. Um, I'm supportive of the low income for the disabled community. Um, I, I, I think the recommendation from Mr. Chastain um, and which was the, agreed by the applicant um, is a good idea. I mean, a meeting of all the stakeholders to talk about the pros and the cons of should it be all in one building or not? And as what Commissioner Farshad just mentioned, um, Frasan just mentioned, is does it really have to be all in one building? Um, so, you know, explore that a little more just to, to either confirm or deny that that's the case. So I think it, it, it would be productive and I think a meeting like that should occur. Um, and I did, I do have a little bit of concern over losing some commercial, um, but I, you know, I appreciate the getting it back close to 30,000 square feet. Um, so um, I think that summarizes my comments at this point. Thank you, Commissioner Eisen. Uh, Commissioner LaBonge. <clears throat> Mine are pretty similar. I'm gonna do them real quick. I'm supportive of the project. Um, I do think uh, uh, this is where we want to have residential development. Um, I would like the height to be lower, but we are a little handicapped on that in terms of what we are allowed to do. I don't think it's going to be completely out of scale, so I'm, that's something I can live with, um, but we have to anyways. Um, commercial space, I, I, I'm that worries me a little, but I also think the market will dictate that. So we'll have some in there. And, and as we continue through future planning commissions and, and DRCs, having more housing, you know, there'll be a point where it will become clear that we need to be more or less uh, concerned with that. Um, again, the market will decide. I'm, I'm supportive of the staff comments. Those are a little more, some of the architectural ones. And I'm not gonna delve into that, it's not my specialty. 
uh, the affordable housing in the, in the congregation in one product. When I came into this, uh, all my notes were, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. Um, but after hearing this, uh, I've changed my tune on this. Uh, I do feel, again, for that product type, people will self-select. And if they do want a, a more dispersed inclusionary with um, non-IDD type living arrangement, that's what they will search for. But I feel in general that it's an under provided product type. So just getting it is a big thing. So I'm happy we're doing that. Um, it's not my specialty. And so that's something that I think we'll learn more about, but I think it's a, a big benefit and having the supportive groups that, you know, uh, Sunflower and others talk about it. I think I, I could understand both sides, but I, I feel like it's going to be a good thing. Um, I'm also very supportive of their support for the Park Theater Trust and, and that um, you know, that's tied to this development, quite frankly, it's very clearly tied to this development that's right in their MOU. Um, but I think that's a, a great additional benefit for the city that uh, um, is, is attributable to this development as well. So in all those things, I'm, I'm supportive of this project. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner LaBanche. Uh, Commissioner Maggio. Thank you. Um, well, I haven't heard anyone say it needs to be taller. So I'm in complete agreement that, boy, don't we wish it was just one story shorter, um, but it isn't. But with that, I, I am in support of housing downtown and particularly for challenged populations. I think that's really a wonderful idea. I did like also what Tom Chastain had to say about just really getting that whole community together. Um, I understand that one size doesn't fit all. Some people would probably be better in a situation like this. Some people would be better in independent living. I think what's nice about this project is that it does have shared common space where people uh, can gather together on the Lafayette Lane. So even though you live in one building, you have an opportunity to mingle with the whole complex. And I have to say, you know, working in, in campus planning, this really did remind me of a college campus residential design uh, that I'm so very much used to where you have your independent buildings and then you also have um, communal gathering spaces. So I found that kind of interesting. Uh, since the building materials are very, very sturdy. I really challenge the architects and DRC and staff to also make sure that the design stands the test of time. I think we really need to look at those color feeling and fine tune it a bit so that it doesn't become dated while the materials are there forever. So I, I look to, to uh, DRC to help lead the charge on that one. Uh, and that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Maggio. Commissioner Mason. Um, just a few comments here. I also am supportive of the project. Um, I actually had an office in that complex for a number of years. And yes, it is dated and everything else. Um, the, the building heights face going forward are going to be what they're going to be just doing some back of the napkin math since it was raised early could we reduce the unit sizes four stories to three stories that's 25 percent there since i can't reduce the corridor widths, that's another 10 percent so all of a sudden those 1100 square foot units become 715 square foot units and that's a one bedroom slash studio um i Personally, I have uh, three families I know, four adult IDD children between three families I know. And, you know, for every one of them, the biggest choice is what's the best place and everybody will make a different choice. But I can tell you one thing, there's nothing worse than listening to a mother talk about how she had to, they found the perfect place for their son, but it was in another state because there wasn't anything around. And that was really, really hard. Uh, one of the things I especially like about this project is I love the roof decks. I'm one of these people, the more the merrier. Um, 
My idea of the perfect roof deck is the one that they have at 555 YVR in Walnut Creek. Um, cooking, wet bars and stuff like that. So you could actually have a, a, a function up there. Um, but again, I applaud the, the owners for coming up and trying to serve this. And I think that yes, we be nice if we get the stakeholders together, but even questions as simple as how do you mix condos and for rent in a single building can be tough decisions because both of them have different financing models even before you get into trying to serve IDD. So again, I'd like to thank everybody on this project. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Cast. Yes, um, I look forward to seeing the project built. It's not ideal, but there are many aspects of it that are much better than what we've seen in general for people using the density bonus. There is something given back to the community, which some of them don't give back much at all. Um, I appreciate the fact that they listened to us from the May meeting of 2019 and they put the parking underground. I think they improved the Vista from the uh, Mont Diablo Boulevard. I um, am in favor of the extension of Lafayette Lane to get up to the, to the East Bay Mud pathway, however best they can do that. Uh, in regards to staff comments, um, I'm not sure that I'm against the banding. It's sort of inconsistent in some ways because when I look from one building to another, some of the lighter colored upper stories look pretty massive. I mean, if I look at them on the renderings, it looks like you have expansion joint lines, but when you put stucco up, you're not gonna see that from a distance. It's just gonna look like one massive area. So I actually like the banding of the darker material down below. And um, I'm encouraged to keep that. I also am in favor of the staff suggestion of integrating more um, activity areas within the, the general uh, circulation pass. I, again, I, you know, it was a little confusing on the drawings that we were looking at how things were old scheme or new scheme. And when I look at their, what they were discuss, discussing about 23 feet and 15 feet and 15 feet to turn around the ladders. Obviously that's gonna have some contr controlling aspect about what you can build out in those buffer zones. But I'd like to see a larger or an increase of activity, public activity in those zones. I think it would be enhancing to the project to do that. Um, I Going back to the colors, I, I have flexibility on the colors, but I actually really encourage the use of the blue and the burgundy. I have to tell you is I'm getting really tired of seeing gray and beige in this town. And I look forward to some imagination and change. Um, so I'm in favor of the project. I, again, like everyone else, I wish it wasn't as high as it was. And in regards to the, the handicap um, disabled, um, you know, I, I encourage them to talk, but in reality, even if we were go back to where we are right now, it's not like we're designing for the last 10% of that community to get it right. We're actually designing for the first 15 or 20% of the community. Okay, we don't have a lot of that. And most communities don't have a lot of that. And it's really much needed. And that's what I encourage us that I think that in order to improve inclusivity, we need to make sure that the property manager really works in the capacity to do that. Okay, because they can help to integrate that one building into the overall complex. That's the, that's the, some of my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Cass. Um, Commissioner Gray. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I, uh, I agree with uh, pretty much everything that uh, uh, the planning commissioners and, and commissioner Cass have, have shared so far. Um, I, uh, and I also uh, wanna thank Nancy for her report and, and her very good recommendations. Um, I, I think I agree with the general ones uh, in their entirety and I have some specifics um, to add to some of those. Can I ask uh, if we could see the, the colored site plan uh, sheet A0.2 is who's running the screen? Would that be Greg or Nancy? Nancy. I'm happy to yield the screen uh, to Nancy who might have the plans at hand. Otherwise I can uh, seek them out. Did you say A0.2? Sorry? You, uh, what she was it? A, A0.2. Yeah. Yeah, just, just for context for everyone to. So, well, I'll wait for you to pull it up on the screen. So I agree with uh, Nancy's recommendation to improve the pedestrian scale and experience on the podium walkway. Um, when you look at this and you see the orange brick colored uh, uh, Lafayette Lane, um, I mean, it looks like a fire truck path. Um, and that's because that's what it is. Uh, if there is something that the design team can do to uh, make this feel more like uh, sidewalk scale somehow while still letting the trucks through. Uh, I, I don't have the answer, but I will say that I, I think there are opportunities to do it and still maintain a solid drivable surface for trucks. Um, when you look at your renderings of this, especially when you're in the middle part of this site, it's just vast areas of undifferentiated brick. And, and I really think as you develop this, you can come up with uh, some kind of uh, more pedestrian uh, feeling walk surface and, and edges. Um, the next comment I have that you can see on, on this plan has to do with the kind of node in the center near the commons building. Um, there, there's kind of a bend in the street and what you know should be a, a center point, a real node of this development is just kind of a truck turn. Um, I would like to see, I mean, to some degree, the commons building has a little chamfer there and response to the curve. Uh, building number two is just like any other building, except the only way to make it fit is to kind of tilt it like this. Um, if I, I understand you want your units to be standard and you uh, variation makes things tricky and I wouldn't suggest changing the entirety of building two, but I would look at the corner of that building that is closest to this center node and see what you could do to shape uh, a public space that's at the center uh, of this property. Um, okay, so that, that's all I wanted to say on this, uh, this image. Um, the other, I think my other comments don't need visual aids. Um, I, uh, regarding the way you handle building scale, um, I mean, it's their large buildings. We all agree that we'd rather they were one story less. Uh, I appreciate the massing moves that the design team has made uh, at the ends of buildings one, three, and four. Uh, I think those are the right places to drop them down. Um, I, I appreciate your efforts to break up the scale of things. In my view, you've actually gone really too far in that regard. It's uh, a collage, I would say, that lacks coherence. And uh, I, I, I think that with surface treatment that is a little bit less, um, I don't know, it, it almost feels, I think Nancy probably said it better than this, but it feels a little bit jumbled to me. And I think a, a little more coherence uh, while still maintaining the kind of massing that you're showing, but not quite as much of a collage of colors, uh, just a little quieter composition uh, while still maintaining the break of scale um, uh, would be my advice. Um, let's see. And uh, uh, regarding the metal siding, um, with the colors being, being permanent, as, as were pointed out, uh, we do want to make sure to get the colors right. Uh, we also, I think, um, 
You want to understand the real look and feel of the materials, uh, how much sheen or texture, how, how metallic versus soft does it really feel. Um, you know, in the old days, we would see sample boards at a conference table. Somehow, we need to see the real materials and get a sense uh, of what they're going to look like. Um, you know, uh, another material to consider that I would say is equally durable, but maybe a little uh, and practical, but maybe a little softer touch would be a colored cement board. Um, so just just as, as another possible option. Um, let's see a minor point, your public elevators. I hope they're glass um, for safety reasons. Uh, you don't want to have a public space where you can create um, that kind of, of unwanted privacy. Um, Okay, the Mount Diablo frontage. I would like to look at the visual aid of, uh, of that if I could. Um, and see, that would be, there's a colored rendering near the end of the set, um, 6.4, a 6.4. So I, I can start to talk about this if, if Nancy, you don't mind pulling this up. So. I would say that my comment about um, the collage sort of lack of coherence is most evident on the Diablo frontage. This is the part of the property that I think, you know, wants to have a, a balance between a variation and, and, and where there's plenty of variation now, but I would say more of a sense of street frontage uh, of sort of it being commercial. There is not a lot of identity here. Um, and, and maybe there's a deliberate uh, desire to break things down, but I think it's, in my view anyway, it's gone too far. Uh, I, I would like to see uh, more transparency as Nancy recommended. Um, uh, I would also like to see a little quieter variation than what you see here and maybe some more uh, hierarchy of importance. There's the, the entry that splits, uh, that, that's kind of right behind the silver truck um, I, I think that probably should have a, a stronger presence as a, as a major building entry. Um, the, the high pieces of glass, it's not clear to me the reason for that. Um, but, but one way or another, I would like to see this as a pedestrian street with storefront, uh, even though it may be a commercial office rather than retail. Um, that could change over time. And this is at the very west edge of our, our uh, eastern zone, uh, which I, I would like to see considered as a retail friendly uh, pedestrian sidewalk. And let's see, did I have one more? Oh, and then um, I, I just agree with Nancy's comment uh, regarding the uh, additional landscape screening on the first street side. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, that would be helpful. Uh, in general, though, I think you've done a lot of good things with this project. I'm certainly very supportive of the housing opportunity uh, for the developmentally disabled. I think that in, and in, if this project can make that happen, I think that is a, a very nice thing for Lafayette to do for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gray. Um, Commissioner Sim. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I wanted to also um, uh, mention uh, I'm uh, very uh, excited about this project as well from uh, the housing element and benefit to the city. Um, my comments relate to the design, of course, and going into that, um, I wanted to um, mention generally, I agree with uh, the overall uh, comments that the staff had uh, put together. Um, and my um, uh, key things would be about the uh, main uh, contextual information. Uh, so this uh, slide that we're uh, uh, looking at would be one where uh, I, as one of the commissioners, would like to see more of that street frontage uh, so that we can uh, calibrate how this pattern language works off of the remaining part of the block and maybe one more block off the side on the right side. I understand that the street uh, character is evolving and transforming, but still from a snapshot moment, I'd uh, like to see how uh, certain elements are picked up and how this piece plays a larger role in the urban design character of our downtown. Um, I also uh, wanted to uh, bring forth a, a staff comment as well as what 
uh, my colleague, Commissioner uh, Gray, just mentioned, I piggyback with him as well, uh, more uh, transparency uh, would be uh, appreciated here on this street uh, scene, um, both uh, literal and phenomenal, meaning, you know, there's glass, but sometimes you could see through, sometimes you may not, but uh, there's a way to scale that uh, distant views and midpoint views uh, from uh, across the street uh, landscape. So when I say that, I'm talking not only about the storefront characteristics of the uh, uh, commercial office uh, opportunity there on the main street, but the setback into the uh, Lafayette Lane that appears uh, in the mid midpoint and then further out in the distance, if you gaze through the uh, uh, that uh, slice uh, through this entire parcel uh, project, that uh, there we, uh, would be an opportunity to kind of capture uh, the uh, distant views as well, if there's a way to do that. Okay, so uh, one is about the uh, transparency, so please uh, uh, further uh, go about uh, dealing, uh, uh, articulating and uh, detailing that part. The other part is uh, about the first street, uh, I do uh, also want to share uh, and, and support that, uh, as Commissioner uh, Gray also mentioned. I would like to also uh, see more landscaping definitely there. And even though we may not see the building uh, behind it, uh, uh, behind the parking, right? That's the side view of uh, building number one, I believe. Uh, that we still want to make sure because we can't just rely on trees forever. Um, uh, so we would still want to make sure that uh, if the trees uh, aren't uh, pruned properly or the uh, foliage isn't full, then we'd, we'd still see the building. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, the building there uh, could stand on its own, but also with the tree uh, further um, embellished in the, on the first street, that we would have that fully covered uh, to present well to uh, people who grab the, uh, what do you call the freeway at that entry point to the freeway in that area. Okay, so uh, the uh, other thing is on the site plan. Can I go to the site plan? Uh, I think Commissioner Gray uh, was good about that, uh, pointing out the site plan. I would like to see if Nancy or uh, Greg could put, put back the site plan. Thank you. So, uh, uh, thank you. So this is A0.1. Um, I do see, as uh, Commissioner Gray was talking about, and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Gray, I was thinking the similar. Looking at this, uh, it doesn't have a, a sort of a beginning and a midpoint uh, of the entire experience. Not that you have to formalize it, but as Commissioner Gray talked about, and that, that's what I was talking about at the outset of the meeting, is that the, the uh, hinge point or the elbow shaping point of where building number two uh, a common building and the building four and, and five, there is an opportunity to create a node there or sort of the outdoor indoor uh, pause point there. Uh, maybe it's a, a differently articulated uh, 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 a pervious uh, soil, I mean, a uh, pattern on that uh, pavement area that could even uh, spill over to capture more of the asphalted area. If so then we could uh, make that whole thing appear to be uh, parkable you know, I'm talking about even that place where the uh, asphalt concrete uh, goes into and uh, merges into that bollard area, that even that part could potentially uh, allow it to become a more generous plaza look. And I won't say this because this development opportunity presents a very wonderful opportunity for our city and our citizens to enjoy uh, this uh, 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 linear uh, park-like feature that lets us connect back to East Bay Mud. And then the other thing I want to mention as part of this overall thinking to the architect and the uh, 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 developer is the beginning and, uh, 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 beginning and the ending points, uh, so to speak. I'm talking about an opportunity where the elevator brings you up to the uh, plaza, upper level where the residential property is. If there's a way to allow it to be a little bit more of a generous or some sort of a pause period, uh, to allow some um, a way to understand and acknowledge the beginning of that path uh, up there. And then the other one I would suggest is where the uh, building number one is, uh, where uh, on the first street side, where also the series of bollards are located. If there's a way to kind of present a welcoming, you've arrived to an edge point, that would allow this whole uh, area to further become defined, not as a leftover space, but again, 
uh, defined as some um, uh, deliberate intention to give community a sense of uh, 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 presence on this, uh, uh, you know, experience. The uh, uh, the other uh, comment I have is um, about the details. Um, I, I I think that uh, the base that uh, Commissioner Cass and Commissioner Gray talked about at the base, if it's stucco, uh, you know, uh, to articulate that stucco, and you want to protect that stucco because the stucco at the base uh, could potentially get, um, uh, you know, uh, it won't last the uh, test of time uh, in some instances, but if you're going to use a uh, line, uh, I believe uh, the architect should give us a more detailed uh, uh, of that. Is it an ornamental reveal? Uh, certainly that's what I think the intention is, probably not a control joint or an expansion joint, which is going to just be lost in that look. I would recommend a darker tone as well, but also Chair Sturm talked about how to, if you're going to do a lot of colors, uh, look at some ways to uh, create more rich, uh, more uh, deeper look, uh, rather than just a, a primary color look. And so that last comment I have on the building uh, pieces would be the corner, as also Commissioner Gray talked about. Uh, uh, look at how to detail the corner parts, particularly like building number two, because when I stare at that building number two, I see the corner uh, really pinching into that uh, center uh, focal area that has an opportunity for a plaza uh, sort of square field that expands out of the common building. And so that would be one I would really uh, recommend uh, highly to get that building to have an opportunity not to change the unit size or, or, or lose a unit count, but uh, try to articulate building two, which is presented in a different way with uh, a color and uh, uh, strategies on uh, the uh, cutouts of balconies or uh, extended balconies, that is, and a window release that could occur on that facade uh, to make that a little bit more of something a little bit more different from the rest of the other buildings. Because this is uh, the five buildings, they all look similar. Uh, so that's it. So thank you very much, Chair uh, Stern. That's it. Thank you, Commissioner Sun. Okay. Um, a few comments. Okay. Um, well, starting with the the below market rate rental units, um, I think we've had a really thorough discussion and I, I would support staff helping to get the stakeholders together to, to just discuss it and make sure we're not, we're not missing anything and, and everybody's clear on what the different options are and what the, um, what the pros and cons or the repercussions of those are. Um, just personally, I worked for several years as a project manager for an architecture firm that specialized in affordable housing for different populations with um, physical special needs and cognitive special needs. And I don't know if this is an outdated, I mean, I know I'm, I'm wholeheartedly in support of inclusion. And I know inclusion has been um, sort of the model for schools. I don't know if, if housing has changed since I worked in housing, but when we did those projects, the entire project was dedicated to that population. So just personally, I can envision how this model would look and feel and work. And one potential benefit to having all the units in one building could be that the architect could pay special attention to um, ways they could universally design that building, like maybe things that, you know, things that could happen in the common spaces and circulation areas that would be, make that a more comfortable um, space for, for people of varying um, needs. Um, Let's see, in terms of the commercial space, I am, was very pleased to see a substantial increase in the square footage for commercial because I, um, I was one of the, the commissioners at the first um, design study meeting that was concerned about, um, or I, I heard the public comments that were expressing concern about displacing those needs and, and, um, and concern about all the housing, um, the new housing that's being proposed in Lafayette, sort of helping our community trend toward being a bedroom community. So I, I like seeing more commercial space. And I would hope that the preference can be given to existing tenants when filling those, those spaces. 
Um, I think the design of the project is much improved and I, I too appreciate that the, um, the architect definitely took all of our comments from the previous study session into account. Um, I love the underground parking and the improvements that that allowed for, including the improved vehicular circulation and fire access. Um, and we haven't talked about it, no one mentioned it, but I think the ample bicycle parking is great. And the fact that it's distributed throughout the site um, is, is gonna work well. Um, in terms of the height, I, I feel like, you know, we've seen a lot of density bonus projects and, and the buildings are much bigger than what the city had planned. Um, but in this case, I, I think that the architects done a skillful job of working with that taller structure. I like the way that they've stepped down at the, um, the ends of the buildings. So I, I personally think that given what the architects done with the massing, and then also the slope of the site and the way that it's shielded from Mount Diablo and First Street from other um, parcels that it's actually, it's gonna fit okay. I don't think that it's gonna be anything. I mean, I was out there today looking at it from different vantage points um, and I, I think it's gonna, it's gonna fit and it's not gonna be something that people are taken aback by the change. I mean, I think the, the parcel will be um, substantially built out compared to what we're used to now but i think that's a good thing because they're providing this whole pedestrian um lane and we're not going to have the visual of all of these mostly empty parking lots that we're we have currently um i agree with most of staff's recommendations and i very much appreciate commissioner cass and gray and sims additional comments um, I really liked Commissioner Sims' idea of creating a central, central space where the, the lane turns and looking at the corner of building two, maybe as part of that study, I thought that was a great idea. Um, and then also Commissioner Gray's comments on, on how to bring the lane down to a pedestrian scale. So I think those, those two ideas could probably work together. Um, I do agree that um, so, and I'm deferring to the design review commission, but I just wanted to add a couple comments. Um, I do agree that some simplification could be made to the design, but I did notice a lot of the visuals that were provided to us in the set were our 2D renderings. And when you look at the 3D perspectives, I think that their material choice makes a little more sense. You can see where they've chosen a material on a complete volume. And I personally liked that they've chosen certain materials. You can sort of, when you're looking at the exterior of the building, you can see where the circulation cores are. And um, I think going with that sort of mode of thinking and trying to simplify from there is, is going to work well. Um, in terms of the staff and commented on the siding and the, the way that that lighter color makes the balconies pop out. And I, I too, um, I agree with that comment and it, I think it could just be maybe even the same material, but just darkening the shade of that, of the color a bit. Um, and then lastly, I'm glad that we, we talked in some detail about the connection to the aqueduct trail. I think as um, that's looked at more just thinking about where different types of traffic are coming from and, and the path that is preferred for them to go through the site. And um, that, that should be part of that study. Um, I mean, when I first, my first impression was that having the connection where the game house is would be preferable, but um, we'll see, have to see how that works out. And I think if, you know, for someone walking, that's sort of a straight shot, but for someone biking, if they're coming up the side and through the pickup and drop off space, maybe, you know, they're going to BART, maybe continuing to the West and somewhere on either side of that parking area along first straight may, may make more sense and be sort of a smoother flow for them. Um, okay, that's, I think that's all I have. And I think collectively we've covered all of our bases 
I didn't hear really any conflicting comments. So my sense is that the applicant and their team should have a pretty clear idea of, of what kind of changes we're looking for. Um, and given that we're just, we're continuing the project to a next meeting, my understanding is we don't need a formal motion. Can I make one last final comment? Sure, Commissioner Cass, go ahead. Um, this is personal preference, but I'd like them to lose the fire pit. I think in this day and age, we need to go green. We need to eliminate those type of sources in the environment. It's there only for aesthetics. It's not there for any practicality other than aesthetics. Um, are, those are the ones that are on different roof decks. No, it's right. Uh, it's near the kitchen area of the community center. Oh, okay. It's in that arched area. Okay. The, curved, the curved area near the plaza. Okay. I don't know if that's something. Do we need consensus on that? <laughs> Does anyone else? We could ask them to come back with option, different options too. I mean, they, they mentioned a water feature there, but I wasn't sure how that, what that was supposed to look like. There was I green don't think wall. It's yet. It's just theoretical. Okay. I think the developer can take the, just hear the comment and respond okay. at the next meeting. Great. Does anyone else have any additional thoughts? Okay. Um, so, Greg, do you do we need to make a motion on anything or? We would ask for a motion to con for continuance. Okay. And we had the date, what was the date? December? 7th. December 7th? The 7th. 7th, okay. Okay. Do I have a motion to continue the project to December 7th for a joint meeting of the Planning Commission and the Circulation and Traffic Commission? And um, Public Art Committee as well. And the public art committee. Okay. Oh, and actually, before we, before someone makes a motion, um, to the design review commissioners, is there anything that you want to come back to you? I mean, I don't, I guess we haven't mapped out how we see the rest of the five meetings playing out exactly because the project's just moving through. I think we'll okay. just have to rely on staff to review what they do in response to our comments. Well, my only question is about, I guess, about the color and materials board. So it seemed like that was something that you wanted to see in more detail. Is that sometimes in conditions of approval, we'll ask for- that, That's a standard condition of approval for projects oh, okay. in the downtown is submission of those and mock up on site. Okay, um, so. okay got it. Okay, um, so we are ready for a motion. Commissioner Radnich is our is our usual motion maker. Somebody else. I'll make motion? the motion, but I'm on design reviews. <laughs> but I'll make the motion for the. Think, yeah, that's fine because we you all have a quorum and it's a joint meeting. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, just it's one motion for both bodies, right? Correct, I believe. Greg. <laughs> I, I haven't uh, experienced this question before. Uh, it, it, since the continuance is not for the design review commission, oh, it's okay. for the planning commission. I just call, call me overly cautious, but. Uh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cass for volunteering. We'll let it... so, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll move. So I move to continue the meeting until December 7th for the Planning Commission, the Circulation Commission, and the Parks Committee? Public, no, Art. public Art. Public Art Committee. Um, so moved. And I'll offer a friendly amendment that we're continuing the application, not the, not the meeting. Accepted. Second. Okay, so motion by Commissioner Barsan and second by Commissioner Maggio. And so then we'll take a roll call vote only of the Planning Commission. Okay, um, so Vice Chair Barsan. Aye. 
Commissioner Heising? Aye. Commissioner Labonge? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Commissioner Mason? Aye. And Commissioner Sturm? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so thank you for everyone who stayed through this item um, and for all the good questions and, and answers. So we are now moving on to item nine, other business art volunteers for November 13th. I guess we need a volunteer from the Planning Commission and the Design Review Commission. I will be for the Design Review. Okay. Thanks, okay. Glenn. <laughs> Thank I'll you. do it for PC. Okay, we have Commissioner Cass and Commissioner Mason. And then um, item nine, commissioner's reports. I was going to ask about the GPAC meeting, but um, Commissioner Radnich is our, our liaison. She's not here. Um, Greg, do you want to give us a quick update? I, I'd be happy to. If I were in attendance, I had a conflict and was oh. not able to uh, attend. However, I can say um, that it was largely kind of administrative um, and regarding Brown Act and um, reporting requirements and uh, conflict of interest and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think, and it looks like Commissioner Maggio won. Yeah. Sorry, Commissioner Mazzi. It took me a second. I thought you were showing us your wedding ring or something. No, I, I the attendant. alternate I did attend. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, uh, it, it was exactly as Greg said. It was uh, education on the Brown Act, and it was really getting the whole GPAC team on the same page of how to conduct a meeting and how to move forward. And the following meeting, though, will probably be a lot more interesting because it's about the history of Lafayette and how we got to where we are now, which I think <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely going to tune in to listen to that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I was planning on listening too, but I missed that one. So I won't feel too bad about missing that one, but I'll try to make the next one. Great. Okay. Um, so Greg, do you know when the interview panel for DRC is on the week of November 30th? I do not. I'll ask uh, Lisa to reach out to you tomorrow. Okay, yeah, they haven't confirmed the date yet. Okay. Right. You told me yet. I'll make an inquiry. Okay, any other commissioners have anything to share? Oh, Commissioner Gray? Yeah, I just, uh, a quick report out. Uh, I uh, joined Greg uh, in a meeting with <clears throat> uh, the design uh, and project uh, team for the Terraces of Lafayette. Uh, they're doing kind of ongoing work and Greg asked if I would join him for a study session. This is the second one I've attended. Uh, so just to share that with the public. Great, thank you. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks everyone.